Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am so excited to say that this is the beginning of a new semester. It is the end of 2021. It will be called the 2022 semester. This is today, December 11th, 2021, and I'm welcoming a bunch of new students who are here and many beautiful returning familiar faces who are here also to the one-room schoolhouse of everything that is flying rainbow lasagna. Wait, let me grab my sculpture. I have it right back here. Sorry to duck off camera for a minute. Right back here. So the way that this presentation will be structured going to be a two hour lecture, one big long recording. The first hour will be focused on the level one materials that reflects what is in the recorded lessons on Teachable. The second hour will be level two, which is the advanced materials on Teachable. And I am planning on uploading this recorded archive to YouTube. And so that means that on, and I'm also gonna still be, there we go, still a few more people admitting, cause we're um, you know just beginning here. There are certain things that I, um, certain words, key phrases, and also topics that are the unmentionables, quote unquote, the Voldemort, he who shall not be named from Harry Potter, of things on YouTube. So um, when we need to talk about Voldemort, what I'm going to say is I'm going to do a separate recording after the first couple of hours of things that will be publicly uploaded. Then we can have a Q&A session that will be only for patrons and uploaded to Vimeo, where I do not face the same limitations on um my vocabulary words and topics that can be spoken about. So for anything that's a Voldemort, I'll just say, hold that thought and well, I'll do that for a separate recording later. And I will have, of course, a Q&A for all of the stuff that I'm talking about, the level one and level two stuff, which is non-controversial in any way. And also it's an outfit that is good in any season. Like I started these lessons in 2013 and started it as part of my um, intentions with the cosmos to share this information more fully and in, uh, in articul uh, articulated with human language form uh, than I had been up until that point. So up until uh, 2012 or so, um, mostly what I did was artwork and this type of sculpt sculptures and animations and sharing in a much less verbal, much less intellectual and academic sense. And what I started to find was that it was necessary for, for me, I think, I learned a lot by becoming a quote unquote professor and um, setting up my information in um, linear thought blocks that could be digestible to someone as opposed to like when you look at a painting, it's a complete download all at once because I had to come to understand that many people's minds or that the prevailing thought structure in this world, um, people like to have things um, created into sensible increments just like if you were to teach someone the piano, some people are ready to just dive in and just be like, blow, like here's a song, you just use both hands and do this. And some people are like, no, like we will start with this chord today and then this and then this and then this. And it's cumulative learning where you have foundation building blocks and then more, more, more each time you go back and also review and um, repetition is also part of the cognitive learning structure of this place. So I had to learn how people learn so that I could teach effectively. And that's what I did from 2013 onward. That was my, my um, uh, you know, my effort here. So I'm very happy and proud to say that I did level one in 2013 and level two, 2014, 2015. All of these lessons are still highly relevant because the information is just this pure abstract information, even though I also now have greater um, perspective to augment what I've what I've um, presented in the past. So it's definitely worth it for anybody who's already tuned in or who's already who is a returning student to return, uh, go, go over the materials again. And also I was just saying to everyone while we were kind of waiting before getting going formally that I, even though I recorded these lessons myself, was going over them um, in preparation for today's class. And I get new insights from watching things and remembering them and going back into them. So just like rereading re a favorite book or returning to something that you're familiar with, as you gain new perspective, there's always some new insight when you return to it. So I encourage and invite everyone to return to it. So that is how today's class is going to be structured. So yeah, I'll have a QA and a at the end of each section. So at the end of level one, we'll answer the questions that are relevant to level one. At the end of level two, relevant to level two, then there will be a separate recording Q&A for anything that might be a possible um, Voldemort catchphrase that we would not want to say of the unmentionables. Okay, good, because I still want to be able to have free expression. And right now, so yeah, my YouTube um, channel exists as mostly now a music and self-expression channel and also as an archive for the very earlier semesters that I did at this class. And now I'm adding to more semesters. Okay, so I'm also gonna be doing a lot of share screen and a lot of drawing with my magic 
magic um, pens and stuff like that. So that's how this is going to be structured. So starting off with level one, lesson one, this is all about the chakras. And let me show you a picture. And I always ask for your patience and I know I make squinty faces also. I'll just go to this entire picture here. This is not what I want you to see. Here we go, good. So this painting over here, um, this is a relatively accurate depiction of what the chakra system is. Chakra means a spinning wheel of energy. It comes from Sanskrit. And here, let me also just do a little, there we go. I think that'll be better. Um, spinning wheel like chariots. So the uh, ancient Sanskrit, so our ancient Hindu culture, I'm just getting a drawing tool. Um, if you can see where I'm highlighting here, here, like this is like one wheel, a terrible drawing. And this is another wheel. You can imagine they're like a wheel and an axle, if that helps as an analogy. And what you're seeing in this picture is a flat static image, but it actually represents three-dimensional energy forms that move. So chakra means a spinning wheel of energy. One of the main things to understand is that these chakras are oriented at different, um, uh, you could say horizontal or vertical, but all of that is in quotes, different uh, contexts relative to your physicality and those orientations connect to a larger superstructure of both energy, light, and time. So I wanted to show you this, just to familiarize you with this, oh, hold on a second, I wanna move this. Let me go back to here, here. So I wanna show you these two things. In this one over here where I'm wiggling my cursor, first of all, you can see that there are these kind of quote unquote wings that extend outward from the central convergence point of this anthropomorphic figure. And anthropomorphic means human form. Anthropocentric means human centered. So there is a simplification here because where I'm wiggling my cursor, you can see that there is one central convergence point. Here we go, Billy's coming in. One central convergence point in the um, form. And I have that centered here at the chest. But as we go on through the semester, you'll understand that each of my paintings has strong points and weak points in terms of the information that is presented. So this is a simplification. It is truthful that you have all of these centered at a convergence point, what that would be like in your heart of unconditional love, but, and you also have a convergence point here at the top of your head, here in your forehead, here in your throat, heart, um, solar plexus, which is like right below your breastbone and above your belly button, below your belly button, and then also at the base of your spine or at the at your root chakra. So you actually have a whole ladder or um, a, a ascension system, a whole ladder of going up and going down, going up and down your body. Uh, so I want to highlight, here we go. Okay, I'm drawing. I want to draw on this wing over here. So you can see, I know that it's it's a little bit difficult for me to control this pen. So please bear with me. You know that I'm a good artist. Thank you. And welcome to everyone who's just in, being admitted now into the class. So that is kind of shaped like a wing. And then you can see that this is kind of shaped like a wing down here, more like a butterfly, not necessarily like a bird's wing. A bird has two wings. Butterflies have more like four wings, but you will find out soon that you in this higher dimensional form actually comp are comprised of eight wings. So you have uh, one, two, three, four that are showing, but then you also have one, two, three, four that are not showing because all of these are flat images and everything is in a cross section. Now I'm bringing your attention over to this other painting on the right where I'm kind of wiggling my cursor. So we've got the positive space and then the negative space. And I'm just establishing terms. When I draw these lobes here, <clears throat> it's still a little bit hard for me to control my pen and my pencil. Let me see if I can do it better like this. Ah. Uh, that is the negative space. And negative space in art terms does not mean bad or wrong. Why is it so hard for me to make this pencil work? There we go. Where I'm kind of coloring, that is not bad or wrong or undesirable. Negative space means receptive, or it means the space that is not something that is a positive form. So for example, in a coffee cup or a glass of water, the positive space is the ceramic of the cup and the negative space is where the water goes into the actual coffee cup. So you have two different forms in these structures. You have the outer form that would be like the coffee cup, 
here where I'm highlighting. And then you have the inner form in here that would be like where the water flows, positive and negative space. And I'm not gonna, I'm just about to get going here onto this idea of the time vortex because I just drew that over there. But I wanted to bring to your attention the idea of that this is all, these are all nested energy forms. So you can see it within this football shaped or lobe shaped energy form, it is nested into seven sub layers. There's red, then there's orange, which is half the size of red, yellow, which is one quarter, green, which is one, uh, sorry, yellow. <sighs> Let me start again. Red is the primary unit of one, orange is one half, yellow is one third, green is one fourth, the light blue is one fifth, the dark blue is one sixth, and the violet is one seventh. And those proportions are divine harmonic proportions. When I use the word divine, again, I'm just establishing terms here. I'm talking about an abstract divine presence or an abstract form of God and divinity, not necessarily an anthropomorphic, human-shaped, human-faced, one that might be considered from earthly descriptions of religion or biblical descriptions or earthly mythology. And this is what we're talking about is a realm of pure energy and a realm of pure abstraction. And I say that with complete respect for anyone's religious beliefs or affiliation. So this outer membrane here, what these membranes are comprised of is flowing energy. I'm also going to, in all of my, I'm teaching you about my diagram language. As I make these V shapes, those are like arrows that are pointing down. So you understand that that signifies that there is a flow of energy that is going, let me see if I can just make this uh, a little bit bigger. I can change the, uh, forget about it. Oh, maybe like this. Flow of energy, nope, never mind. Sorry, I'm still trying to learn how to use the drawing pad here. A flow of energy that goes in this direction. And um, there's also a complementary flow of energy that goes in this direction. So just like a waterfall or like a sheet of water or a sheet of pure energy, you these um, membranes over here have a thickness to them. I'm over-exaggerating the thickness. And you can see that it's a big giant circle. It actually goes all the way up and around and then down to here. And then there's a complementary one that goes down and all the way up and around. This is how the torus is shaped. And the torus, a torus means a donut shape. And the donut shape is the precursor to the flying rainbow lasagna shape. The torus donut shape is something that is a um, universal constant or cosmic um, energy form that is in existence, that was in existence for an incredibly long amount of time before the invention or augmentation known as the flying rainbow lasagna. It is the, um, it is the form of so many different things. I have to list them all. So it's the form of your light body. Your light body is made of time. Your light body is made of probabilities and possibilities. It's made of potentials like the, the, the potentials of future existence. It is made of pure thought and pure creativity or pure consciousness. It is something that is not necessarily recognized by present science in this level of reality in this time space here now. It is because we have electromagnetic light that we can perceive, which is light that comes to our eyes from our nearest sun star. This is a light body that is different. So when you look at a person, you see their physical face, like you see my physical face here. I also have a light body. And that light body is this energy field where I'm scribbling right now that extends outward away from me. It can extend out as far as my arms stretched out. Each one of us has this. It can extend out to my whole entire house. It can extend out to my whole entire neighborhood. It is dependent upon how coherent the light waves that you emit are and also how much energy you have. But please understand that it is a real presence and that in order to perceive it, what you need to do is perceive it with your eye of insight, which is a different apparatus for perceiving light than the eyes of the physical world, which perceive the light of the physical world. So you need the higher dimensional insight eye to be activated, to be able to see the higher dimensional light form, light body, which exists in a spectrum of light that is a different slice of the frequency pie uh, outside of physicality light. Um, let me talk about, well, I'm jumping around a little bit because I do that with my brain when you start to understand me more. Let me talk because I drew this out already about time and the time vortex. 
because what I just drew down here, this little sketch, file that away in your memory banks because I'm going to return to that sketch quite often and I'm going to simplify it. So sometimes I might just draw it, you know, just like a very simple, quick little drawing like this during class that you'll understand what I'm referring to, that each chakra actually has four of those. So there's one that's up here too. And then there's also one that's over here like this. And then there's another one that's over here like this. So this painting that I'm using has kind of a simplification that's only showing one um, half of a chakra or like an apple core shape or an hourglass shape. And I'm asking you to focus on this area over here. This represents the pathway of your life. So you could imagine that this is filled with, I'll change colors. Let me see, how do I change colors? Ah, now I can see how to make things bigger and brighter and more visible to you. We'll use yellow. Um, each one of these where I'm drawing these yellow lines represent timelines. And right now I'm drawing them as straight lines that are up and down or like simplified lollipops. But please understand that that's my shorthand. What you actually have are time spirals that spiral around this cone shape and then come up here and converge where my point, where my pencil point is going right there. That dot that I'm circling right there, that is the singularity. That is the zeroth dimension. That is the point of infinity. So you might also see me represent it as a little figure eight, an infinity symbol. And it means that you, when you reach that dot, you do not stop in the trajectory of where you're going. You actually continue onward in these pure figure eight movements. So when you see, uh, for example, you would trace down like this, reach this point over here, that's a central convergence point, and then keep going like this. I know I would go off the screen if I went all the way, and then return back to the central convergence point, and then go back over to here, but that's not the end of your journey. So you could see a figure eight right there. Then you would go in a slightly different pathway through the middle. And I know my, my pen doesn't work that easily, but you can see these are all overlapping figure eights. So wait, let me see if I can draw that a little bit better for you so that you're not frustrated. Here's a figure eight. Oops, it's very hard to draw. Figure eight, and then back up like this, but then like this. And then like this, so this is the beginning and I have a whole lesson. So just understand this is the first day of class. This is introductory. I'm kind of playing music for you and telling you like, this is a piano and this is what's going on. Oh, here's Martine. Very good. Um, that I want you to kind of get an overview of what everything is and know that I will delve more deeply into all these um, things as we continue onward. So I told you that this is a spiral of energy moving upward. What I'm showing is a simplified flat looking you know, kind of stick figure of the, what time is, and that each one of these lines represents a timeline. The ones that are over here on the periphery are short, and they're short in terms of chronology. So if this, oh, and here's Lucy. Very good. I'm so happy to see. I'm so pleased to see everyone joining in. I'm going to put a letter, a number zero down here, because that represents birth or year zero, and understand that time in chronology points upward in this map of time or map of your life. And that as each of these lines gets longer, that represents a timeline that is your life getting longer. Now I'm gonna choose a special color. Let's choose a nice special color. I have that purple to be this special timeline that starts over here and goes all the way up the center and never stops and goes here into the infinity point. So in this map of time, there is only one timeline that does that. There are an uncountable number of timelines where I'm scribbling over here in the periphery to the left and right, or which would be considered like in, in a, from the top down, it looks like a bullseye and I'll draw it from the top down here. From the top down, this map would look like this, like a record, like an old fashioned analog record that you would play Led Zeppelin on. So that's the infinity point that I just drew there. And here's the time spirals that start from the outside and go closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, converging in, and then boom, you reach the inside, exactly like an old fashioned record of music, except this is the music of your life. And there are, like I said, an uncountable number of possibilities and probabilities in the area where I'm scribbling. That's multiple branching timelines that end in death. There's only one timeline 
that ends in this continued journey and renewal and infinite um, uh, unity consciousness. And that is your ascension timeline. And that is the goal of what each one of us wants to align with. So you can consider yourself to be like, um, like a, moving along a pipe or a timeline. And if you are askew, then you end up going like this and hitting the edge. And you, you, the analogies that I use are like that old game called Operation. I don't know if you ever played that game, but you're trying to get a little thing out of a person's body because it's an operation, like get out their funny bone. If you touch the edge, eh, like there's a little buzzer and you die or something like that. Or bowling, you can consider bowling. Like this is where you want your bowling ball to go straight down the center of the alley and then kapow, you knock down all the pins as opposed to these would be the gutters and you get a gutter ball if you hit the membrane of death. And I don't know if Pedro will be returning as a returning student. He was in the class maybe like four or five years ago, but he made up a very good analogy, G-O-T-A. It means game over, try again, wah, wah. So this is in a lighthearted way, using the analogy of your map of life being like a video game, even though, of course, I recognize and validate the very truthfulness that pain is real, suffering is real. Please never be a sociopath and be like, oh, well, like it just doesn't matter. I'm dying on this timeline. Oh, and also, hold on a moment. If, if you don't mind, everyone, please mute yourself just because it helps for clarity of the recording and you can unmute later to ask questions. I, I just, I don't know how to step out. I don't want to step out of my, my drawing mode here, but please mute yourself and thank you so much. Um, the idea that not being a sociopath or completely disassociated from pain and suffering because these peripheral selves over here are very real versions of you. This is like a choose your own adventure book. I don't know if you guys ever read those, maybe in middle school, they're kind of like you know, preteen reading. Uh, choose your own adventure. You find yourself walking through a forest. Uh, there's a path to the left and a path to the right. If you choose the path to the left, turn to page six. If you choose the path to the right, turn to page 37. And it's a way of going through a narrative structure that's a branching narrative that um, brings you in different directions. That is exactly what is happening here in the map or the song of your life on this giant record, record album where you make different choices. And sometimes those choices are not even intellectual choices. They might be biological choices. So if I use as the example, starting out over here at this edge where I'm drawing a black, big black dot, that's birth. And each one of us has the potential that as in the moment of birth, you died. That was not necessarily even a choice or a conscious choice that you make because you do not even have conscious choice apparatus in your intellectual capacity of having a brain. But some babies are born with the cord wrapped around their neck or they never breathe in properly or they have some other defect that their life is over in the very first moment that it begins or some other catastrophe happens, whatever the hospital is in a war zone and it gets hit by a missile as soon as the baby is born. That's what um, this is. Uh, being born, traveling a very short amount of time, maybe being born for one moment, and then hitting this flowing membrane of death. The membrane of death is an abstraction, is an abstract force of energy. This area is meant to be a clearinghouse of energy, but and it has been occupied by many times by consciousness residues, which we will talk about and acknowledge later. And what then happens in the journey of your consciousness is you circulate around to the next position where you then try again, game over, try again, get born again, same, and born again does not a reference to biblical literalism or any particular flavor of Christianity here. It is the sense of um, try again in the um, choose your own adventure novel of your life to see if you can go further. And the next opportunity, maybe you're able to live for an entire day. And then, oh, you know what happens? You got exposed to some germs. Somebody sneezed upon you. You caught a virus as a one day old baby and then died and hit the membrane of death and then had to flow back and then had to circulate back around to here and then try it again. And then you made it to maybe a couple of weeks old. And then, oh no, you fell out of your crib and you died and you had to circulate back around and try again. So the very, the, there are, many, 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 many deaths that happen here at the periphery that are just in the beginning of your ability to have a body and know how to have a body and know how to be alive and eat food. Like that's a big part of just it, whatever age you are. So take a moment. 
to appreciate the success that you have made it to this level of adulthood. You are 18 and over, which I think all of my um, participants and um, audience are, then congratulations because you have made it through, I will just make circles, so many, so many, so many, so many, so many time loops where you're like, oh, and then I fell off my bike in traffic when I was nine years old and had to go back and try again, or any of these things, choked on a Jolly Rancher, go back and try again, any of those things, or childhood diseases, great unlikelihoods and um, uh, you know strong likelihoods that make people have to die. Again, not uh, what I'm describing here is not ideal. I'm actually describing here a pathology, but I'm being accurate about the experience of what we've been going through up until this point. And I will then contrast that with the ideal pristine world that I actually came from and that I'm much more familiar with. Um, so whatever, let's say this is your timeline that you're presently on, let's say you're like 39. Congratulations, because you had to go through a lot of this stuff over here just in order to figure out how to eat food, how to have an immune system, how to have balance so that you don't fall over and crack your head open on a sidewalk, how to navigate the world of um, other people and find resources and be alive, how to learn how to advocate for yourself. And that's pretty amazing. However, what we are all trying to do is to align with this central core possibility that is the only one I'm going to try to highlight over here. You can see there is a gap that is a very emphasized wide gap here in this drawing, that is where there is no, I'm going to use, use my hands to kind of gesture, the membrane of death does not touch next to each other. There's a spot, there's an opening, there's an aperture. That is how you exit this quote unquote video game. So the deaths are real, the suffering is real, your lives on those parallel li lifetimes are real. Here's the other good news. Well, that's like, I don't know if that's good news, but here's the good positive news. You are not actually obliged to play every single wrong note on the piano before you hit the right note. This idea of blindly going through time, looping, 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 and hitting every wrong note. Here, I turned on my piano. So let's say we're trying to get to a C, but I'm like, well, first I'm gonna play this one. No, that's not right. No, not right, not right, not right, not right. No, no, that's the one, that's the note that I actually want. That's not actually how you're supposed to play the piano, not the, the genetic piano. <clears throat> What you're supposed to be able to do is to read the score of time. That means have your eye of insight activated, be able to see the future, be able to see timelines as an abstraction and also as an interpreted reality and make your choices in terms of navigating dependent upon what you see. And I also say this is like driving your car when you can actually see through the windshield, very, very different than driving your car if your windshield is encrusted with mud and you have no idea where you're going. Of course, you will drive off the side of the road many, many, many times before you manage to kind of navigate on abusing your feeling and your intuition um, in the center of the road. Um, we are all supposed to be able to have a fully activated eye of insight and this crown up here, and I'll dis discuss more energetic anatomy about that, but that's how we're supposed to live our lives and that um, how do things used to be. This is in the world that I talk about a lot. That is, I, I, here, I'll go back to my face and then I'll go back to the drawing again. Don't worry. Um, uh, I call it that sophisticated antediluvian realm. What is known in this world, in this time and place as either Atlantis an ancient or mythological time that was once civilized and exalted and that has now fallen, or um, Hyperborea, or Agartha, Hagartha, Shangri-La, Shambhala, um, Hyperborea. There's many different myths about it and other ones that, that from different cultures that I'm not aware of. So, um, you know, my, my cultural sensitivity meter goes off there because I just, I don't know everything. So there are many others that I just haven't uh, referenced here, but there's a very truthful, understanding that there's a cultural vestige of a time before death was invented. And when I say before death was invented, it means that even though we had chakras in that time and we had light bodies in that time, we did not hit the membrane of death. Every bowling ball that we bowled down the bowling alley of time reached the destination of returning to the source that emanated us perfectly all the pins fell over. We got 10 points. Hooray. We all did it. We all always ascended. So this is part of my um, re, re, I want to say rewiring, but not in a technological sense, a presentation of thought structure to you. That is a rectification of the presentation that you received when you came to this world 
as a beautiful newborn baby with all the potentials of your brain and of your mind unformed and everyone around you taught you about the inevitability of death, which is basically programming you for failure because the um, uh, expectation is, was, and remains for many people that, oh yes, death is inevitable, that you will die because everyone else dies and that you can even go back into childhood and remember maybe what the first time you were ever exposed to death or to a death or to a concept of death, that it might have been a grandparent. Here, let me close my door just because, oh, my dog is gonna run out, hold on. You know, Cheeky always has to make some kind of an appearance. Sorry about the interruption. She always says a little something and then she might have to come back later. Um, uh, death. It might have been the death of a goldfish, death of a grandparent. Something happened when you were a child before you even could conceive of death. And then you found it, you experienced it, and someone had to teach you that that's a thing. And when you learn that that's a thing, it changes the DNA behavior of your body. DNA is a bridge of light. And I'll go over this many, many times in repetition of the class. It is a bridge between the physicality structure of your somatic cellular body, because there is DNA that science can see and, and touch and measure and weigh, and the non-physical, pure consciousness, light body of time. The activity of what DNA is doing inside of you as it dances, twists itself around, knits itself around, splices itself apart, moves itself back together, all of that dance activity is what propels you through time. When you, before you know about the concept of death, your DNA is dancing and dancing and dancing. You're like, woo, like I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm going through life. And then at a certain point you learn about death and the DNA structure changes its dance and says, I now dance with the expectation that at a certain point I will hit the membrane of death and dance no more. That is a new concept. That is not the pristine concept that I, or world that I'm familiar with where everybody knew there's a potential, like, yeah, like you can get a gutter ball. That's all stuff on the side. Like you, in, and in that time and place, it was more the sense of you could fall off a cliff. Someone could shoot you with an arrow. You know, some, all of these different things could happen. However, there are ways when you can see what, this is a big, big part of the teachings of this class. Your life and quality of existence is so expanded and exalted and greater and different when you can actually read the music as opposed to flying blind or playing blind or playing by ear. When you are a musician and you can also, you can read the notes. First of all, you can see the notes that are coming up. You're like, oh, A sharp, uh, B minor. I'm gonna play this over here. And then you can also determine, do I like those notes? Do I wanna participate in that song on that level? Do I want to change the focus of where I'm going and then be like, oh, I don't want to play A minor. I want to play G major going in this direction. That is what I want. So I don't know if you get, I'll just use a more modern analogy. If you ever watch the TV show called Rick and Morty, which is sometimes silly, you know, bathroom humor, but sometimes profound. There's one episode where the young character Morty gets a time crystal that he implants himself in his forehead here. Like there's deep profound spiritual truth in the silly cartoon. And then he uses that to be able to see the future, but he's using it of course, to be able to get the girl of his dreams in high school. So he only uses this to navigate like, well, if I go in this direction, then she'll be my girlfriend. But if I go in this direction, then she won't be my girlfriend. So everything is focused on like a very small, meager desire, a very ego-based desire, but I like the idea that he's trying to use his time crystal to direct his life. So understand that when you activate these higher centers of your beingness, first of all, you're moving beyond the smaller level ego desires. It's not just like, I want to find my girlfriend or I want like, you know, uh, whatever, a slice of chocolate cake or something minimum like that. Like we're talking about the fulfillment of profound spiritual desires, even though love can be a spiritual desire, but not something that is merely surface level or ego-based. It is much more about, I'm gonna talk about this in level two, the balance of balancing out your self state and your ego desires with a much larger responsibility to time and light consciousness itself. So, um, okay, let me go through the color proportions. Let me go back to share screen because this is part of the math that I think is very good. Let me use a different picture for you here. Okay, good. So, and I'll get the pen going. So this is the scratch board. Oh, now Cheeky has to come back in. She's very, very inconvenient. Come on in. Okay, good job. Good job. Oh, come here, come here, come here. Here, okay, good. She's gonna jump on the couch over there. Sorry to be um, uh, distracting you. This is a different viewpoint of what chakras look like. 
And I like this picture because it's very accurate and it shows very accurately the scale of how here, the uh, where I'm wiggling my cursor, we have the anthropomorphic seated human form. Then you can see how it is contained within the much larger red physical level. So red is always the biggest and the longest wavelength and also the slowest wavelength. Let me now talk to you about wavelength and frequency as we are creating or establishing a commonality language of what we want to say. So first I'm going to say, like, let's say this is a, where a squiggly line over here, this is the seashore, like the edge of the ocean. And where I'm squiggling over here, that's where there's water. Every single one of these waves is like a wave of the ocean. Here's a red wave. It is a big, giant, long, slow wave. I know it didn't drop perfectly. Wavelength is how long this wave is going across like that. And frequency is how many of these wave peaks, this area right here, go past a spot in a moment. So let's say in one moment, we have one big, giant red wave that comes in. But in that same amount of time, what we have are two orange waves. Orange is always one half the size of the red wave. And this is in cosmic proportions that I did not make up. This is made up by the great composer. But sometimes if I dilate myself big enough and long ago enough, then I'm the great composer. So just understand that it's truthful for all of, all of you, all of us, all of unity consciousness. The yellow chakra is always three wavelengths. One, two, three it is one third the size of red. And there you have three peaks, it goes faster, shorter wavelength, faster frequency. Got it? Let's do green. Green is always going to be four. Boom. Two, three, four. Four green waves will go by in the time that one red wave goes by. Let's do light blue. That's going to be five. One, two, three, four, five. Five of those guys will go by in the time that one long, slow red wave will go by. This is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the blue chakra right here at the top of your head. And then seven, violet, that's the fastest wavelength and, and uh, shortest frequency. Let me try to count properly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven within the human spectrum. So now I will play on the piano. This is an octave because this is also auditory information. So for me, my eyes came online first and then my ears came online second and it took many years, but it, it might be opposite or different for you. So I just turned it up so you can hear. I hope it's not too loud for anyone. One octave in human musical notes goes from C to C. Okay, and here's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and then to red, but what actually happens in this color recipe is called additive color mixing. This higher C is white light. So what happens is there is light that is coming from our sun star. I'm pointing out my window right now. The light is first of all, intelligent. It is sentient. It is full of food for your mind. It is a nourishment for your light body. It is made of possibilities and probabilities. And there's a difference between additive color mixing, which is the um, rest colored recipe of what happens with pure light, as opposed to painting with pigments. I painted this sculpture with pigments, even though I would love to paint with pure light in this realm here. Um, uh, different rules for mixing pigments that is called subtractive color mixing. And I can get more into that as an art teacher later, but simply understand that in the world of pure light, and that can also mean if you are doing something like uh, set design, theater design, where you have different colored gels or spotlights and you're bringing them together, or certain printing processes with translucent inks, there are different rules that apply in terms of additive colors. It means that color waves add up to one another and make a end up with a color substrate. So do, 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 do purple, what I have on my on my pen right now, purple, this wavelength right over here is the end result of a magenta plus, and that should be a magenta, not a fire engine red, plus a blue. And blue is always a cyan. Magenta plus blue equals violet. 
This is how rainbows in the sky are formed through actual refraction of light from the sun through the lenses and pris prismatic structures of water droplets and all of the varying tones of color that you see are the end results of additive color mixing. Light waves that literally, I'll kind of go up to my screen here, literally stick stack on top of each other. Here's a light wave, here's another light wave. They overlap on top of each other and that is how you end up with a particular color. It is additive color mixing. So let's talk about this in your body. Your body is the end result of light being refracted. In fact, let me clear off all of this stuff. Because your body is a refractory of light and refinery of light. So let's first of all choose white light. This would be considered a beam of white light that comes from the sun or the source of pure consciousness into you. It comes in at the top of your head at your crown. This crown chakra, which is violet, the highest frequency, shortest wavelength, like the highest note, here we go, highest note on the scale of what it is or the frequency slice of pie of what it is to be human, comes into you and you are just like, you know, a prism that is this triangular shaped, you know, uh, structure where light comes through and then ra rainbows come out on this side, you are like that crystalline prismatic structure in that when white light comes into you, it is then refracted or separated into its various color levels. So you can see there's a violet color level here where I'm highlighting, you know, actually I'm not gonna go through all the different colors because I wanna be able to fit a lot of information into this um, uh, presentation. So let me just find a, a relatively neutral, I don't wanna use a poop color, like brown is neutral, but it's poop, I'll just use white. Each one of these layers, violet, dark blue, light blue, green, yellow, orange, and red down here. Those are part of the color recipe of what white light is. So if white light is like a cake, because I like talking about things that are like food and cake, the red would be the thing, what's the most in cake, like flour. It's the biggest in, uh, ingredient in flour. And the orange would be like maybe sugar. And then the yellow would be eggs. And then the green would be uh, flavoring, you know, whatever, or, uh, you know, vanilla extract. And then you get up to a little bit of baking powder. And then you get up to here, a little bit of salt. And those are, and then, you know, like whatever, a pinch of cinnamon on, sprinkled on top of everything. That is quote unquote, the color recipe of what cake is. That is the color recipe of what consciousness is. So this pure uni unified information comes into you as a being that is a crystalline structure being and is then not fragmented, but separated or segmented out into these different layers. And all of this is divine and properly pr pristinely proportioned in the way you want it to be. And everything that I'm drawing here and all this anatomy is perfect. I'm not drawing anything that's unhealthy. So an unhealthy chakra would be like if this orange one, let me get an orange color, was kind of askew if it was oriented more like this. And then, you know, here's the top vortex and here's the bottom vortex. That would be like, oh no, like that chakra is not looking so healthy at all. It's totally askew. That would be like your tires on your car being out of alignment. I'm gonna wiggle my pen. Like if your tires are not in alignment, they're kind of uh, askew like this or like this, your car is not gonna go down the road straight. It's gonna go like a chunk, a chunk, a chunk, a chunk, a chunk. And all of these layers stack up on top of each other that you can see there's a uh, yellow stacks up onto orange over here and green stacks up onto orange over here and um, here blue stacks up onto green over here. I don't know if you can see it on all of your um, screens if it's too tiny, but please understand that all of these wheels stack up on top of each other. So if you have one that begins to go at an angle or has a wobble to it, um, then it begins to destabilize all of the others. So all of the, it is necessary in order to have chakra health and energetic health of your time body to treat this as a holistic whole, that all of these layers of being need to be understood and appreciated. Um, I'm just approaching my notes over here to make sure I'm getting right. Okay, so this energy field that is made out of light and time and possibilities and probabilities it surrounds your physical body and it also interpenetrates. Here you can see it going into the actual physicality. Let me draw a spine in this person. Oops, go back, keep that white light there. 
So here's your brain kind of simplified. And then here's a spine simplified. It goes up and down the center of your body. Each one of these chakras has a convergence point on your spine, it goes directly into your nerve system there. And so this is a very, your spine is a cr critical part of anatomy, not only in terms of carrying neurological signal, also in terms of carrying light signal. And I want you to understand that there's a non literal analogy between your neurology body and your light body. So there are crossovers, but it is not a 100% literal analogy, but your neurology carries signal, it carries intelligence, it carries light, but also all of the somatic structure of your body contain and carry light. Um, okay, I'm just looking at my, um, these energy fields are comprised of many flowing waves. So you understand that this is a spiral, that spirals along like this, and that each of these torus structures is made out of many, many, many spirals that fit together. It, uh, it is, uh, so uh, here's a wave and you create a force field with many, many, many waves kind of stacked up next to each other. So it becomes a presence or a larger coherent force field. That is what these are that surround you. You have a force field of light that surrounds you. Let's also talk about what emanates what. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the force field come first or does the, the physicality body comes first? So there is a consciousness presence that comes first that then creates the anthropomorphic form. But then out of that anthropomorphic form, there is projected through your DNA structure and the um, existence of your life, you know, mo moving through time, these time structures are created. So it's actually the answer is both, both and. First, you have a non-physical structure of pure consciousness and potential out of which you create a anthropomorphic somatic cellular structure, which then emanates these non-physical energy fields. If you die a common death by hitting the membrane of death, what happens is these energy fields go bye-bye. Still have corpse, still have this white figure here, but you no longer have the energy presence that has been emanated from that figure. Um, chakras are fractals. They are nested, smaller self-similar um, aspects of self. Let me talk to you a little bit about what each layer represents. And I'll go over this many times in class. Red is the physical layer. And that represents not only your physical, somatic, cellular body, but also objects in the world. Like I'm in a room, there's paintings on a wall. All of those things are represented by the red layer. Orange is mammalian, emotional energy. Emotional energy is different than the energy of unconditional love. That's up here. I'll get to that. It can be anything from sadness, grief, revulsion, anger, heavier, denser emotions, to joy, sexual attraction. It is sacred, sa sacral, sacred sexual energy. So where I'm highlighting on this figure, that's an area kind of like right above the butt it, it, and right at the base of the spine. That is the sacrum. Sacrum equals sacred. The energy that flows from there and flows up the spine is sacred energy. It is creative energy. It is life force energy. And these are supposed, supposed to be giant wheels of joy that when you're living your life you know, perfectly and in freedom, you have big giant like, kind of joy balloons that hold you up. And um, the uh, sacred, sacral energy is also part of reality creation. When we get to this level of our, uh, yellow, um, I often highlight in class that that is a hacked aspect. Let me also just drink a moment of water. Pardon me, thank you for that. Um, yellow is an imperfect level in what's going on with humanity, that we have a sense of dis distortion or diminishment or dysfunction at this level. It's not quite the way it's supposed to be. It's the implantation of the human mind that is your daily waking consciousness that is verbalized, that is the intellect. I call it an implant. It's not necessarily your original natural mind, which your original natural mind is up here at the level of dark blue and is usually a nonverbal mind of pure insight. So we come here as babies without a fully formed yellow level. We learn the yellow level from our cultural immersion, exposure to mom and dad, because you have to learn how to say like, hey, I'm hungry. Like, hey, my diaper's full. Hey, I want this. I want that. You learn how to verbalize. You learn how to think. And it also involves the perception of time. Time meaning understanding not only how to read a clock but, all, clock, but also linear time before, during, and after. 
uh, linear time, first breakfast, then lunch, then dinner. Little children learn this, but before, go back to a time in your mind before you were a fully formed uh, you know, person, when you were a little child, you might not have remembered time. You just flow, you just flow from moment to moment. And also at this level, we have the people who are implanted with mind defining what mind is. That mind defines mind and will define it as having certain characteristics as opposed to recognizing mind in others, which for example, my dog. My dog has mind, but it is different than the human intellect. Dogs do in many senses understand before, during and after or have a sense of memory and things like that. But many animals are just very much in the moment. And also like, what would a, a flatworm have a sense of time or a rock shrimp or a redwood tree? Like these are different types of organism that have a different ex experience of time. So the idea that creatures who have this implanted type of intellectual mind then use that as the um, uh, definition of what mind is to in totality sense is very flawed. So please don't fall into that anthropocentric trap. Understand that all animals, my dog has a chakra system of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and so does a flatworm, and so does a redwood tree, and so does our planet, and so does our sun. So there is a yellow intellect, a daily waking consciousness to each of these structures, but it is different than human. And human intellect over here is a little bit troubled. And when I say troubled, it usually means that it's a software program that's been implanted that is a bit limited. Red, orange, yellow. Oh, hold on a minute. And also, hold on one second. Let me plug in my notes that over here, it's gonna lose my batteries because I've been running around doing lots of stuff and not, not plugging in all day. Sorry to interrupt our our lecture with a moment of plugging in. Through human history, the definition of what it is to be human, and this is, you know, from like the recent past, the past 5,000 years or so, has been a red layer. You're a physical person. We can all agree about that. Orange layer. You've got mammalian emotions, such as I want to have sex with that person, or I hate that person, or I'm angry at that person, or any of those things, or I'm hungry, or I want something. And then uh, intellect, and that has been the definition of what it is to be human. That clearly is ignoring or slighting this whole area up here that I'm circling now, which are the higher faculties, love and above. Green is unconditional love. That's this right here. Unconditional love is a tone. Let's play a tone. It's an A. Hey. Um, and I, I, I just say that that's what unconditional love would be but that's a rather arbitrary um, uh, assignment. But unconditional love is the tone that you make when there's an equal giving and taking. So the amount of energy that I'm sending out, I'm sending out 10 units of energy and I'm receiving 10 units of energy back from the cosmos or back from my partner or back from that which I'm in reciprocal experience with creates the love tone. So you are in love when you are moving through time at exactly the right rate. You're in love with the cosmos. This is not the same as down here, sacred, sacral energy, which is love, romantic partnership. So don't conflate the two. It does not necessarily mean you want to kiss or hug the cosmos or be its boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm saying that rather lightheartedly. This level of love is the unconditional love, the cosmic love, the love that one might have for the sun, the stars, the ocean of consciousness. It is not an ownership love. It is the type of love of devotion and um, saying that I'm moving at exactly the right rate through time with my time partner. You are a smaller particle, like here's you as a smaller particle and you are moving along like this beautiful wave through a giant ocean of consciousness. And that ocean of consciousness is alive and conscious itself. And the love tone is created from that partnership. Like here's a timeline coming towards you and you are moving along at just the right rate. The green level of unconditional love tone is achieved through meditation. So in previous eras, ages, red, orange, yellow, that's for regular peasants, you regular schmo. You just push a wheelbarrow full of poop and that's your life. But if you meditate in the monastery all day long, then you get to reach the highest level that was available then, that is unconditional love because you meditate and you're able to have a perfect frictionless path through life. When I talk about the yellow level and the problems with it, there's a lot of disturbances here. It causes a lot of friction. It slows things down. It slows signals down a lot. Um, but in this era, each one of us is certainly supposed to become a master of the heart 
and um, be focused on this heart to love tone because that is like the fulcrum of a large lever or a seesaw apparatus where you do have these denser levels of being and then you also have these less dense levels of being and the recorded levels on teachable i use the analogy like a fish the fish is like here's a simplified fish shape uh here's its eyeball over here so you kind of can see what a fish is and it's thin over here the fish swims uh below the surface of the water and so the fish being down here that's like this is you as a fish you're submerged in time you're red orange yellow but then the fish has a whole level of being that's up here up above the surface of the water that it just does not see and recognize and acknowledge and that is humanity for a very long time being a full spectrum human means that you recognize and claim all of this higher self state structure so it's not just about getting to the love tone that is an important plateau in your spiritual journey that plateau creates a literal like a foundation here upon which all of these other wheels are balanced kind of like a pyramid and then you have the reconnection to the divine up here and that reconnection to the divine the crown that's where a baby's fontanelle is the fontanelle is the unformed part of the skull plates when you first come here as a baby you still have a big beautiful open window to the higher self state or to connection to the cosmos and the divine and that slowly over the first year of your life your, your skull plates fuse together and that fontanelle closes up so babies are also pre-verbal or non-verbal and they are still very much in that oceanic consciousness um nothing i'm not saying like you should try to be a baby but i'm trying to say our journey is to go from that um totally connected state then we fall out of connection go into disconnection and then there's returning to that level of connection we're never supposed to fall out of connection just like you're not supposed to play every wrong note on the piano but it is what has happened now we are in the moment of reconnecting so let me go into once you achieve the foundation of unconditional love then from there this is i'm pointing to the throat communication light blue is communication and everything that emanates from your throat and your neck is about communication everything that sticks out from your arms that's gesturing playing the piano writing um drawing anything it is it is where when signals come in they are clothed with meaning and when signals go out they are unclothed so this is a refinery of consciousness where signals come in from the top down higher dimensional realms into this denser realm and then from also the denser realm going upward so it is a bi-directional highway. You are a refinery of consciousness where you take white light and split it up into these constituent elements. You also take stimuli and constituent elements and rejoin it together into white light. You do both of these frequency maneuvers at the same time. So you get an impulse that comes from above. It comes in through your divine connection. It goes through your eye of insight it comes down here and it's clothed with words. It goes through the clearing house of your heart, which is just supposed to be an open frictionless place, unconditional love, pure acceptance. And then boom, as soon as it hits yellow, that's what humans define as, oh, and then I have a thought. And then that, that thought is transmitted to the orange area where you have an emotional response. And that emotional response then is transmitted to the red area where you might have a biochemical response a musculature response, a moving of your macroscopic arms and legs. That is what it means to carry an impulse from the higher dimensional realms into where you presently are, into, into the physic, physicality realm. And then you also are a refinery of experience in the sense of taking a stimulus from the red level. That could be anything from food to you know, the feeling of something touching you or heat or cold or something that you see in the world. And that stimulus gives you an emotional response and the emotional energy response gives you a thought structure and that thought structure goes through the acceptance level of the clearing house of your heart then it is unclothed with words so here at the at this yellow level you think a thought like hey like my face is hot or you know th there's something on my face that's making me hot it's called the sunshine and then goes through your heart and goes up to here here you take away the words but you leave the meaning it's unwrapping the birthday present you take off the wrappings but you leave the meaning in intact then that goes here into your eye of insight and i'll get so many teachings about your eye of insight it's also your christ chakra but this is a non-denominational unaffiliated with any earthly christian church level of consciousness that is open to any any species any being that has chakras 
that, that utilizes this energy form and not only to people in a certain time and place or a certain religious affiliation, goes to that perfect level of insight, which is a nonverbal understanding. And then through this aperture, which is uh, at the top of your head to reconnect with that which emanated it from you to, to you. So all of the things that you eat that are down here, they all came from up here. Literally, your body structure came from up here. Everything that you are came from the stars and came from life. Like the calcium in your bones came from a star a very, very long time ago. All the things that you eat every day, solidified plants, matter. Oh, here's Patricia, good, I'm happy she's here. Plants, matter, all of those goodies that you eat that sustain your physicality body all came from light. They are all gifts from the light world. And so please use them with joy. Like if you are down here in the red level and you're eating whatever, an avocado or a hamburger, uh, please use it with joy and with no guilt and no, no shame at having to eat something. These are gifts that are given to us to sustain us while we are here in, embodied in physicality. But what we're supposed to do is give thanks to the gift giver. Like, wow, thank you so much for this avocado or thank you so much for this uh, whatever, this tomato or orange that I'm eating. It's a gift that came from the sun via a tree that translated light into actual physical form that we are then able to eat. And what we're doing is refining out that light that when it enters into orange is the level of where your guts are. Put food into your mouth. You mash it up with your mouth crystals. It goes into your belly. It goes in there. And then what happens is you take the light out of the food and you send the light back up to the source of light that emanated it through this journey. That it goes up your spine, but it also goes through your consciousness levels of going through having an intellectual impulse, going through your heart, of being unclothed with words, going through your eye of insight, and then going back up to the light world that emanated the tomato or the nuts or the whatever you are eating for your lunch. It is a sacred partnership. I give this light to you, you take this light into you, and you give it back to me. And it is a feedback loop, and it also is reciprocal, and it is it's yourself. You're up here. This is self giving light to self down here. And then down here, you give that light back to self. It's a beautiful reciprocal dance partnership. And also it is a miracle. And I'll get more into the miracle of food. And all of this is part of ascension. Just drinking a bit more. Because it's really important to understand that even though we might be moving into a level of no more food, physical food eating, just pure light eating, Please never be at odds with wherever you are in your personal level of development. If you eat physicality food, please celebrate and respect and recognize that as that is part of this beautiful divine continuum of energy emanating outward, ingesting, and then emanating back to the thing that emanated outward. Um, let me just scroll through my notes to make sure that I got everything that is essential. Uh, chakras and the way that they are oriented have a gyro-stabilizing effect. So they are oriented at this level, quote unquote, horizontal. But you can see that there's also the red chakra that is oriented at this level. And that is a perfect, that's a 90 degree angle right there, showing 90 degrees in human terms. And that's a gyro stabilizing effect. So while one energy field is spiraling in this direction, one energy field is spiraling in this direction. And that is similar to the blades and rotors of a helicopter. And that helps you to fly through time in a stable way. Instead of wobbling this way and wobbling this way, it helps you to go straight through time. So all of these energy centers working in concert help you to go straight through time. I have a whole teaching all about food. I'm going to go more into that, but basically you're a refinery of light. You refine out light from your physicality experiences into pure thought form. Or you could also think going back to the, the record analogy. Here's a record. Here's the song of your life. It's similar to Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. Boom, we have just you know, gone to the center point over here. But this is an analog song. Analog meaning that it's built in reality. And if you want to transmit it, let's say through the radio or something like that, you have to turn it into a quote unquote digital signal, something that is made of ones and zeros that can be easily transported in an abstract sense. We are this translation mechanism, for lack of a better word, device, that's what you are here. You are a translator for the analog experience of being embedded in time, experiencing the record of your life and the song of your life, transmitting it back in an abstract form of pure thought and pure consciousness to the sun and the stars that emanated all of these possibilities and probabilities to us in the first place. You also have to have this apparatus here 
to take energy from this incredibly high vibration state up here coming from the sun and the stars and to be like an energy transformer, making it go slower, 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 until finally it reaches your physicality so that you don't get burned out. Like you can't plug your toaster or your, com your computer is a better example. You cannot plug your computer directly into the power station, like a nuclear power station, too much energy all at once. It will blow the circuits of the computer. So it's necessary to make it go slower, 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 step it down so that it then becomes in manageable increments. Okay, I've gotten everything. Those are the main points of what I wanted to give for level one with the understanding that all of that is an introduction. This is just the first day of class. And what I did a lot of establishing terms, like when you do math, the first thing you do is like A equals this and B equals this and C equals this. And now that we've established what A, B and C are, now we'll talk more about what these things are. So today we did just a lot of establishing terms. And then in future lessons, I'll talk more about that. I'm going to draw the time vortex a lot. I'm going to talk about your Roy G. Biv rainbow body a lot as a refinery of light and a refinery of consciousness. We're going to talk about timelines, time and possibilities a lot. So this is just the introductory mode of that. I now open the floor to any questions or comments or anything that anyone might have that is relevant to level one. And also Patricia, Patricia Sofiukis in this um, chat over here, who asked me a question by email and I, instead of writing it out, I figured that I would answer it today in class. So now that you're here, I'll either answer it because your question was about my experience with artificial intelligence and transhumanism that I wrote about on Patreon. I could answer it now. I could answer it after level two, or I could answer it as part of the stuff that I don't share on uh, YouTube that might be too Voldemort, to that which shall not be named. So, but know that I um, appreciate your question very much and I will get to it. So questions, comments, Thank you so much, Angela. Please unmute yourself because I don't know kind of what, which button to press. I don't want to press the wrong one. Please. No. Thank you. A, Thank you for being a, a question came up, you know, I went through thing, um, prior giving of this course, but a question came up in this little session, you know, the, the green chakra, the heart chakra. I had come across some kind of, even in my own experience, like that it could turn pink. And I don't, I wonder if you have any, like basically it's just this huge compassion. I feel like I've had it in my own experience. And I got the idea from connecting with some, someone who works a lot with Ascended Masters in New Zealand. But anyway, I just thought I'd ask you that question if that's ever come into your awareness on, on any level. I have not experienced that, but I really love that. It's, it's a beautiful sharing. And I, I leave the door open for each person's unique experience. Like here's maybe analogous along the same lines, a friend, Kareen, I don't know if Kareen is tuned in right now, but make sure to catch the archive. She lives in New Mexico and she sent me a picture of a rainbow that was in her sky, but the red and orange were completely absent from the rainbow. The spectrum oh. started really around yellow green and then went up and even had supernumerary bands up above violet that were even more colors. So I think that we are redefining that what I'm talking about in terms of the human octave, Human There's some notes are fitting in between or something. Notes are fitting in between or we're shifting the whole entire thing. Instead of starting down here, we might start up here. And I might be, I... this might be red. That might be the new spectrum of what we're dealing with. And that green might then appear to be a type of pink. So all of this, what we understand is that one of the reasons why I went on hiatus from teaching this class that I did from 2013 to 2019 is I felt that we went through a real portal of consciousness and a real shift and that everything is being redefined and that we're being redefined, our light bodies are being redefined, our frequency realm is being redefined and that you can understand there are new contextual realities and new contextual truths. So I leave the door open for all of those personal and planetary or whatever structure you think of the world is, you know, collective, um, changes and transformations. And I won't ever say like, this is the way it is and it's always gonna be that way, but things are in progress and transformation and met, met, we are in a process of metamorphosis. So thank you for that. It's very interesting to hear about and learn about. And any other questions? Oh, here we go. Let me get down to the chat in Phoenix Rising. I know I make squinty faces too when I look to read something. So just don't make fun of me. 
Phoenix Rising says, hello, Aurora. I've been watching your videos for a while. Thank you. So lovely for you to be here. Thank you for all the knowledge. I know this might seem superficial. Never judge yourself. So forgive my ignorance. Never, never, never. You're in the class to learn. But can we fly in rainbow lasagna to get money so that we can live comfortably and focus on our spiritual journey? I feel limited sometimes by the need to pursue money. I feel I could better focus on my spiritual growth if I did not have to worry about it. That is a beautiful question. It is not superficial at all. It has everything to do with the red level of physicality. The physical superstructure needs food. The physical body needs to have a place to live. Um, physical comforts and the capacity to do things like be on a computer, pay for the Wi-Fi to be able to share thoughts and feelings in, in the realm of humanity, have hardware and software to do these things. To me, these are not superficial needs or desires at all. These are, and it's not merely survival either. The whole idea of this being a superstructure or a holistic pyramid is the idea that at the, the base of the pyramid, the stratum down here that everything rests upon, you do have to have food, a place to live, and all of those things. And then you have all of these other higher self-centered layers of being that stack up on top of there. The short answer is yes. You can absolutely use the flying rainbow lasagna for reality creation, reality manipulation or integration, and reality transformation. But, and this will go, it's a very good segue actually to go into level two. Level two is the advanced level. So it's the presumption when I get going that you've already been through level one, but please, everyone who's level one, please stay because I think you benefit a lot from listening to everything from the more advanced perspective. I'm going to talk about the integration of the Merkaba or star tetrahedron shape into your practice of flying rainbow lasagna because both of these shapes have at the, the center of their com com comprehensive conception the idea structure of what they are, a sense of balance. The star tetrahedron shape is an upward pointing tetrahedral pyramid and a downward pointing tetrahedral pyramid. And these two things represent your upward facing pyramid is all the things that I want. And sometimes I make a funny voice like, yo, like I want this and I want that. And it's okay to have a little bit of attitude and to be an individualist. And that is part of your, your journey of being here. Like woof woof, like I want this, I'm barking at the, at the cosmos. But then also there is the higher self state that is receptive. And there's a downward pointing pyramid that's like this, that is like a chalice or a glass of water. It is empty, it is receptive, and it is waiting for something to come and fill it up. And that is less of like, hey, like I want this, and more of I receive, I'm receptive to this. And this is about divine partnership. So again, when I talk about divine and divinity, I'm talking about an abstraction, a cosmic presence, even a force field that you could imagine instead of like a, a, a person, a man or a woman that grants wishes, that sits on a large crown or a, a crowd, sorry, a cloud or a throne up in the sky somewhere, grants wishes imperiously like, Yes, like you may have this and you may have this and you might have a scoop of ice cream and you might have, you know, a dog bone. Instead of that type of a sense, I think of this abstract divine presence as a vibrating force field, um, kind of like a, a, a garden is made of soil that has the potential to grow plants. And then into that vibrating force field are placed the seeds of desires world seeds. Here's a world seed. Here's a world seed. Here's a desire, a point of potentiality. And when that point of potentiality is placed into the vibrating field of um, uh, energy and um, uh, life force and things that can possibly happen, it then sprouts and grows and reverberates outward into the manifested experience. And I think it's important to understand and identify as self, self-state, all of these things, all of these layers of self. So you are the great creator on a very, very macroscopic scale. Like you have to pan way, 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 way back. Like when you go into ancient time, like, yes, you are that creator. You invented the art studio. You invented the paints. You invented the pigment. You invented the easel. You invented everything. But that was a very long time ago. You are also this individual artist with this particular art studio called your life. This particular painting that is called, you know, this day or this journey this particular set of desires, like I want to put red paint on my paintbrush and I want to paint something that looks like this. And this particular world seed that you're emanating with your mind, but not just your human mind, your consciousness apparatus into this vibrating field. And I told you in uh, the earth left level one stuff, that's the A note. Um, oh, no, sorry, let me, there we go, play it properly. The, 
the no unconditional love note of your heart. It's a resonance frequency that is made from an equal giving and receiving. So the idea is that we are miniature fractal versions of this larger divine creator presence and that we are giving to the time field and also receiving from the time field. So in using the Merkaba and in doing Flying Rainbow Lasagna, this is also a balanced shape that is about love tone and giving and receiving. It is about balancing out individual desires. A, this is what I want for me and the desires of what I want for the collective. Because when you have this balanced perspective, you identify as light itself. Light is intelligence. It is organization. It is nourishment. It is energy. So you recognize. So first, I'm, I'm light. I'm made of physicality matter. Matter is slowed down light. I'm light. Me, this person that's here thinking, my thoughts in my brain are uh, electrical signals, quote unquote, that go around your neurology, like electrons flowing in a wire. So that's light. I'm light in the sense that I have this big giant light presence around me. I'm light, look, I got light coming on me from the sun over there. I'm light in the sense that I eat solidified light. I ate avocado today and that's a piece of solidified light. And I'm also light in the sense that I'm made out of time, that I align with time experiences. Like you can imagine yourself like Pac-Man. Pac-Man, I know it's an old analogy, but almost everyone knows that video game. It's this little guy and he chomps along eating a white dot as he goes through the video game and you want to eat all the white dots you possibly can. I'm Pac-Man going moment by moment and I'm eating each moment. That is what we are doing. But the idea of meditation and mindfulness is a receptivity. So practice this with your mind throughout your day. Instead of like, I'm very analytical and task oriented. I'm like, oh, I gotta go here and I gotta do this and I gotta do this. I got the laundry list in my head. Like I gotta do this, this and this and I gotta jump, like jumping ahead thinking which is presented as a very responsible analytical administrative feature of our mind. And it separates us from animals and other forms of organisms that don't necessarily have an iCal calendar in their phone where they're looking at it and scheduling their lives and thinking about, well, at first I have to drive here and then I have to do this and then I have to go to this place and then I have to do this place. Um, all of that level of, I call it laundry list thinking, takes me out of the moment and also is an anticipatory kind of thinking. That means instead of me going at one dot per minute, I'm eating a dot, I'm eating a dot, I'm eating a dot. I'm like, I'm gonna jump 12 dots ahead, think about where I need to go, think about how I'm going to get there, which again, this is a survival mechanism for being in this time place right now, but not necessarily respectful of the larger flow of time and the great creator and the experience that we're supposed to have. So basically we become at odds with the way that our natural perception of time works and how we would naturally flow from moment to moment, which is how we came here as beautiful babies with your fontanelle wide open, connected to the divine. And then you learned, well, wait, when you go to school, you have to know when is it time for the school bus? And then you also have to know, ding, they ring a bell. Now it's time for this, ding, they ring a bell. Now it's time for this training for work, training for being an adult human, all of this stuff so that you then know to think, I have to anticipate, I have to do this at this time, all of this takes us out of the pure love frequency. Please know that we are recalibrating back to the pure love frequency, which is respectful of ourselves as higher self state creator that gave us this smaller fractal version of self state embedded in time that we're meant to have what artists and athletes call the flow when you are in the flow. So when you are in your expertise of whatever that is, if it is playing the piano or if it is doing tennis or basketball, Sometimes you feel like you don't even notice time. You don't even have conscious thought. You just do your thing. And all of a sudden, like hours have gone by. Being in that flow state is actually not a subconscious or unconscious lower than intellect level. It is a supra conscious, higher conscious intellect level approach where you are actually running your mind state at a very fast level beyond the level of verbalization, beyond the level of articulation with thought. But that is the uh, goal of what we want to do, to align with those states that are beyond what I call the hacked human operating system, conscious daily waking intellect and verbalization. All of us came, came here and learned, learned language. We learned language because it's a survival mechanism. So you can ask for what you want and advocate for what you want. Like, give me, give me a cup of juice, like I'm thirsty or give me what I want. Um, but, and also it's a difficulty because once the mind starts talking, they didn't give us an off button for the mind. 
So many of us struggle throughout our lives. Like, oh, thanks very much for giving me this endlessly talking, chatting mind in my brain all the time. And I have a very active brain and mind too. So practices that help this a lot are meditation and mindfulness. Mantra can help too, which is a repetition of a phrase or giving your mind a task to do, which can be thinking about something or visualizing something or doing long-term calculations or whatever the mind is happier when it's like oh like i'm just going to think about this thing like i'm going to fiddle with this for a little while and then your mind has something to do or to to gnaw upon like i'm just going to treat you on this bone for a little while all of those things help to quiet down the mind but eventually what happens is in our metamorphosis state we are able to move faster and faster and faster, faster beyond the limited levels of verbalized linguistics and into a level of pure insight and telepathy. Telepathic language as it is done properly is nonverbal. It is an information packet. And also everyone who's here, I presume your consent, but I ask for your consent, either verbal or you know, overt or non-overt, because I send out telepathic mind waves all the time. And I really greatly enjoy, it's kind of like a, a rapport, back and forth where I send out something even while my words are making slow words and it's so laborious and it takes so long for these words to come out. I'm sending out like 12 million different things are going into your brains right now. So um, yes, consent is requested of anyone who wants to be a part of my telepathic mind blast because I only want to be a, a proper partner. But um, that is uh, the, the goal of what we're doing is moving into states of pure telepathy. So let me go into beginning into level two, and that will give a greater level of answer to Phoenix Rising. But Phoenix, stick with the class because the process of reality creation to, to fulfill your needs, not only the need for money, but the need for a desired timeline. That's what we really want because you know something, it would be a cruel irony, like the cruel irony of the monkeys, Paul. Like I wished for this, but instead I got the turkey was a little dry. You know, it's like the, the like I wished for a turkey sandwich, but the turkey was a little dry. Like the cruelly, um, ironically unfulfilled wishes. You want to get money, but you also want to get the capacity to enjoy it in good health. The happy social superstructure that you can do all the things with. Like in our world, money equals freedom. Money equals personal self-determination, money equals opportunities. So it would be a cruel, ironic misfulfillment of your wish if you say, yes, you can have money, but also like, we will chop off your legs and now you cannot walk anywhere. Like that's not what we want at all. So you wanna align with the timelines where you have money, excellent health, you live in a freedom loving society where you can um, spend the money in the way that you want it. And also I'm very big on the idea that we're moving beyond money, but we're not quite there yet. But for right now, if we're using money as a marker for energy, that money flows to, towards excellence. So the idea is that money, like in the natural flow of energy, if it is unimpeded by any kind of artificial diminishment or dysfunctionality, should flow to greatness. If you do something great in your life, bam, you should get paid very big on this. Unabashedly, you should revel in it. You're like, I did an awesome job, whatever. You run a hundred mile marathon, you're like, yeah, like ka-ching, you should get paid. Or you do something that helps a million people, bam, you should get paid. And you should feel, put your shoulders back. You should feel proud of what you did um, and have no problem with the positive ego structure and positive pride of that. Um, but unfortunately, we live in this world where people get money sometimes from doing things that are they are not proud of or that are not laudable, that are compromises of their personal integrity or corporations do. Like, I made a chemical that killed a million people and then I ran laughing to the bank. You know, I'm thinking of Monsanto or something like that. Um, that's not what we want to align with. So many people here have internalized the negative inverse presumption that therefore a good person must be in poverty because therefore you must do something negative and shameful in order to earn your money. But we're redefining all of that, claim it, claim having money, but also claim being part of um, this larger structure of materiality, where materials, where energy flows, that it should flow towards excellence and greatness. And also we're transcending competition in the sense of like, wait, you got money, but you got money, but I don't got money. I'm jealous and angry of all of you. Like the idea is, of course, I'm ironic and saying all of those things. If you can't read irony, that was irony or sarcasm. But the idea of um, only some people getting reward and some people being cruelly under rewarded in a, in a world that, um, uh, rewards excellence and purity. Yes, if you do good, you, everybody gets rewards and there's enough for everyone. So let me move on now. Excellent question. Thank you. And I'll get more to that 
through as the class goes on, but that's a really good doorway to and Phoenix Rising responds and says, thank you so much. Consent is given and it helps me to understand and align with the timeline where I have money and cultivating excellence. Good. And I'm going to talk now about the Merkaba and the flying rainbow lasagna as reality creation tools and understand that this is also for someone who might already have been studying the piano for a couple of years and you're ready to, you know, twinkle the keyboard in this way. Um, so playing the piano means first you learn musical formalism, like we're going to learn the staff, the musical staff and the notes on what each one means and then how that relates to the piano keyboard and then what is a chord and then all those that's the level one materials and it's very worthy to go through and if you're level two worthy of review even if you're like i'm a virtuoso and i know what an a minor is review it's good Re repeat it, you know it helps to and also help those who are newcomers to the class because that's also like the one room schoolhouse um but also um applying these lessons to, in your expertise to your daily experience um and also let me just say thank you to eleanor for your beautiful comment uh thank you she's making such a beautiful comment of encouragement there in, in in going through the class oh melissa says where are questions being posted melissa you can post the questions in the chat or you can also do there's a little signal at the bottom of the screen you can press on reactions and that's wait wave raise hand like you look like a hand that's waved and then I should be able to see people also, and you can unmute yourself. But I'm going to get going with the formal level two presentation and then take more questions at the end of level two. And then, as I said to everyone, I'll end the recording that's for the public stuff that I will put up on YouTube. And then we can talk about any topics that shall not be named. I'll just drink a moment with irony, anything that's unmentionable, hint, hint, that um, we might need to talk about later, or I will talk about, I think, transhumanism and, and answer Patricia's question as a, a Vimeo for um, patrons only, not in that it's a secret, but that I just might want to be able to talk about um, aspects of technology and other things like that, that we might head into forbidden territory. So um, let me go to the sharing of what is Merkaba. So also level one, I have a whole teaching about Merkaba. This is just the beginning of level two. Let me do a share screen. There you go. And let me also clear, what good, everything cleared out. So, okay, now, hold on a second, because I have all of these, you can see I have everything um, stacked up. I'm Xing that one out. This is from the previous class. Uh, can't get it out. There we go. Sorry to be fiddling around. Oh, and here's my music in the background. And emails in the background. So I need to show you, be showing you everything of my life. Just trying to show you, these are some sketches that I did several years ago. And it's so hard to work with sometimes. Good. Amerkaba. Merkaba. These three phonetic syllables come to us from the ancient antediluvian or pre-flood sophisticated culture known as Atlantis or Hyperborea or Shangri-La. The ka and the ba, you can hear that. That is in reference to ancient Egypt. So basically, in linear time, there was a time before the flood. Everybody had no gutter balls. Everybody ascended. Everybody knew about making these Merkaba shapes around themselves, just the way that we teach children to tie their shoes or have basic hygiene principles as part of their education here. Back then, this was just a part of the learning process of learning that. It was held in trust. Pardon me while I just drink a little bit, because when I get I get going talking so much I get so thirsty. This knowledge was held in trust and passed down to us via many different esoteric mystery schools as the information after the fall, quote unquote, of consciousness and the flood of darkness or ignorance and amnesia. Information like this was held in trust through various mystery schools, one of which or some of which is known from ancient Egypt. This is called a star tetrahedron. You might recognize over here where I'm moving my cursor. Can you see? Yeah, I don't know if you can see. Clear. Let me get a thing to annotate with. Let me get a color you can see. Where I am scribbling over here, you might notice what is would be considered a Star of David outline shape. Star of David, like the representation of Israeli culture or Jewish culture. Please understand that that is a co-opting of this concept, that this is not a energy field or technique or tool that is only for those who are affiliated with a particular religion or a particular cultural background. Just as this area aperture on your head, on your forehead is the Christ chakra. It is not only for people who are avowed Christians. It is not only for people that live in a post-Christ era, like what is called 
um, after death AD. It's not only for people who are in AD, it's people who, who were in BC also before Christ, and also for people who are on other planets or in other dimensions where there were different avatars. Avatar is avatar, meaning one who has come across waters, representative or container of Christ consciousness. So we know or knew a great teacher, a great human who lived 2000 years ago. I recognize and respect those who worship him and, and recognize his greatness and also know that he is a, an exemplar of a type of consciousness energy that is cosmic or universal or is in access to all sorts of different organisms, time scales and dimensions everywhere. So too is this shape, the Merkaba, a universal time tool that makes it possible to both protect yourself and travel through time. One of the major features that you can see is there is an upward pointing pyramid and a downward pointing pyramid. The upward pointing pyramid, first of all, let's talk about the pyramid shape. This is called a tetrahedron. Tetra means four. So we've got four sides uh, to it. Sorry, one, two, Here's the top three, and then the back would be four. Tetrahedron. And so this is a star tetrahedron, two interlocking tetrahedral pyramids. That is in, in contrast to, I'm now going to draw a little pyramid that looks like this is the pyramid in Egypt. Uh, it's a square shaped pyramid. So you have a base that's square. So you actually have one, two, three, four sides. One, two, three, four sides on the top, and then a bottom that is square. So this is important because we're going to go from tetrahedron to octahedron. And you also need to understand that in the, gather my thoughts here, in each one of these systems, you are affiliated with a different level of reality. So this has six points, this star tetrahedron, let's count them off. One, two, three, four, five, six. This six-pointed star, and I'll outline a hexagon here. A hexagon is a six-sided shape, and you can have a mnemonic device of hexagon and six. There's the X sound in there, hexa, sixa. Hexagon is a six-sided shape. Your body, body field structure, everything that is about your somatic cellular structure. So here at the center of these images, you can see here's a person shape, an anthropomorphic shape that is made of many, many, many clusters of cells. All of those little round cells cluster together and make these flower of life patterns. You might have seen the flower of life, and I'll get into some of my own drawings of it. You might have seen it um, as a simplified line drawing that might be on yoga pants or uh, you know, other popular new age gear and things like that. It is essential to know that when you see the flat line drawing, you're looking at a cross section of something that is more like a, a bunch of soap bubbles clustered together. Um, the, sub, the structure of your cells, of all of these little round cells that are like soap bubbles clustering together inside of you is based on sixes and hexagons. Wait, now I'm gonna reverse. I wanna stop share. Now I wanna go back to a different uh, image. Oops. Uh, hold on a second, so sorry because I want to bring up something that is from level one. I'm scrolling. What can I show you? This one is a good example. Maybe this one is a good example. Okay. Good. Okay, sorry to press buttons in the middle of class. Technological stuff, I have to stop this. Hold on a second. Okay, I want to do share screen. I'm going to share the right picture. Share in the right picture. Good. Uh, let me get a color that you can see. Good. Um, each one of these wing shapes, here's a wing, here's a wing, here's a wing, here's a wing. You can see that there's four of them, but that's really only the front part of the chakra negative space, that there's actually four in the back, one, two, three, four. So I know it's a not a very neat drawing, but understand that these guys that I'm drawing that are part of your light body are based in eights. So your physical cellular structure is based in the, the number six. This light body, what I'm pointing to here, surrounding the anthropomorphic cellular form is based in the number eight. And there must be a bridge 
between these two levels of reality. Just like there is a bridge called DNA, that is the bridge between the world of pure light, possibilities and probabilities and being in time that I'm scribbling in now, and the world of little tiny cells. Here's the cells on my shoulder and they all make up my deltoid and then I use it in order to do stuff and go places. Um, all of those things have an interrelationship. So the challenge is how to interrelate something that is made out of sixes and something that is made out of eights. And when you do that, you are able to turn, hold on a second, I'll go back to this other image. You are able to turn, we'll get there. This image over here, good draw please. This image over here from a six-sided or six-pointed star into an octahedron, which is an eight-pointed star. So hexa is six, it's got the X sound in there, and octa is like an octopus, it's eight. It's got the eight sound in there. So I'll count off over here, one, two, three, four, and then there's five, six, seven, eight, because we're just looking at, at half of a cross section. Wait, now, all right, hold on. Now let me go, I'm gonna stop share so I can bring up another picture. I don't mean to be making you dizzy with all of this, but this is important. So I have this sculpture. Oh, let me bring it up so you can see it. Good, I have this sculpture, but it's in my storage unit right now because I recently moved and I had to put a lot of my artwork in storage. So I just don't have it available, but I will get it for our future classes because I use this little orange sculpture quite a lot. This sculpture represents the negative space like I was talking about in lesson one. There, you can see that there's kind of a square shape here. Here's one side of the square, this is a cube. Here's another part of the cube. Hold on, I'm just getting my notes up there. Here's another part of the cube. And that's actually a very good drawing of a cube where you can see how each of these lobes sticks out and reaches a vertex in Mac Talk is a point, a pointy part of the cube. All right, now I wanna choose a different color and I wanna outline a hexagon. I am outlining the outside of a square. Oops, I didn't do it right. Stop, imagine that I didn't do that. Let me do it right. Outside of the square, and I'm making a hexagon. Boom, boom, boom. Hexa, six, six sided. It's counted out one, two, three, four, five, six. Six sides, just like the six sides of the Merkaba, of the star tetrahedron shape. And you can also see that within that six sided outline shape of a flat hexagon, can nest the negative lobe shapes of the chakra system where there are eight. And the viewpoint that you're looking at here shows you the radial spokes. These guys here, they stick out like uh, petals of a daisy, but you understand this is a spoke that is pointing towards your face. And on the other side, so this is pointing towards you. And on the other side, there's a spoke that is pointing away from you. So let's count now. This is the bridge between squares and hexagons. This is the bridge between sixes and eights. So it's six. These are the radial spokes like a daisy. One, two, three, four, five, six. When you see a flat simplified line drawing of the flower of life, you see a six lobed shape. That lobe shape does not include the bridge of your understanding that brings you up to eight lobes and allows you to be in a higher dimensional state. Knowing and in, in, in adding with your mind perception apparatus, the knowledge and expectation that there is also an implied plane that is go, jumping off of the flat plane towards your face and a plane that is going away from you, away from your face. That's seven and eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pointing towards you, eight, pointing away from you. And I'll go through that, that count up to eight many times as I'm doing flying rainbow lasagna with you guys. What, what is the significance of all of this? It is the understanding that there is a bridge between the somatic cellular level of your body and your pure light body. And that in rearranging your understanding of the star tetrahedron into an octahedron, hexa into, into octa, hexa into octa, you get to do the, um, dimensional transfer part of what it is to use the Merkaba. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my face and I'm going to say this. So this star tetrahedron shape, first of all, let's talk about the practice of it. What, what is the Merkaba? This is level one stuff, but I'm just gonna do it for, for everyone. The Merkaba is an envisionment. 
It is an alive envisionment. The more that you use your imagination, imagination is not a dead, stupid thing that children should let go of in order to go to school and become grown ups. Imagination is an alive presence that you use to project reality, and it is part of Christ consciousness, your Christ chakra, your connection to the world of pure light. When you envision, imagine this pyramid shaped presence around you and you imagine it spinning in the right way, you create an alive energy field around you. That alive energy field can have three basic functions of what you want it to do. The first one is protection. Protection like an immune system, pardon the logic. An immune system in your physicality body allows you to ingest things that you need like air or food or water and bear the burden of the things that you don't want. Like my water might have microbes in it, even though I filter it and do other good things with it. I'm getting the water that I need, but what am I supposed to do about those microbes? I have an immune system. My immune system scours my body, goes around looking for anything that's not supposed to be there. And it's like you, get out, get out. It's, it's, it's tough. Like you, hey, you get out, get out. You're not supposed to be here. It's the bouncer of my, of my body. So too is the Merkaba. So the Merkaba is a spinning force field that allows in at the vertex points. So a vertex in math is a pointy part in the star tetrahedron shape, like here's the pointy part sticking out, and then here's the receptive part sticking in, and I'll show you on, on the drawing. Places where energy can enter into your body, and the energy that you want to enter into your body is love tone energy. My voice is a little tired. Love tone energy. You want that to come inside of you. That's like the beautiful food, water, nourishment of the world. You want that to come inside of you, but you do not want the other lower frequency, crapola frequency stuff to come inside of you. So the idea is that the Merkaba is a faceted spinning energy field, like, um, you know, mirrors that reflect out, bounce off anything that's coming to you that is unhealthy, unhelpful of a lower, less valued frequency and not conducive to health and longevity of you continuing to move through time. Again, this was taught to children like as the very first thing you learn, like we teach them how to tie their shoes. This is like the basics of how to have a body. So how do you do the Merkaba? This is a practice I want everyone to be doing. It's an incredibly effective shield for all sorts of energy that you would not wish to um, interact with your physicality body, your physicality presence. So I envision first, so uh, if your body can comfortably sit like with your legs crossed so that you have, you know, um, your, your thighs sticking out like this and your legs kind of, you know, uh, crossed underneath you like this. You can imagine here's one level of the pyramid, here's one level of the pyramid, and then here's the other level of the pyramid. So that's the one that is the pyramid that sticks upward. That pyramid we loosely define as male, but it's not necessarily, these, these male female things don't really work in terms of gender politics anymore, but it is specific. It is intellectual. It is aggressive, quote unquote, in the sense of I'm moving towards this thing, as opposed to receptive, where I'm receiving this thing. It is detail oriented. When you sit in your Merkaba, the first thing you can do is make this upward pointing pyramid. And um, uh, also recognize that there's like a flat face plate in front of you. Well, I'll show you the drawing again. But first, I want to show you on my body. So I sit in my pyramid that's facing up. And then I also sit in my pyramid that's facing down. And that one is complementary, And it has a vertex that emits outward from my heart. So the upward pointing one has a vertex that emits outward from my sacral plexus at the base of my spine, kind of backwards out towards my spine from, from, from the lower back. And my, the one that's up here has one that emanates outward from my heart. And what I do is I start these two energy fields spinning in complementary directions. I'm a female, so I make the one that is in my heart I'm going to turn like this. I don't know if I'm inverted on your screen, but my heart one, I start spinning outward to the left. And the one that sticks outward from my back, I start spinning around to the right. I am told that male biological people would want to do the opposite of that. I tell everyone, do what feels right for your body. Kind of like if you're a snowboarder, like, do you want this foot forward or do you want this foot forward? But you will kind of feel it and know it as you're doing it. It's a feeling state. And when you get these two counter rotating fields spinning, you will also feel moving up the center of your body, uh, a thread of light. And that thread of light connects the top vertex with the lower vertex. And in the lower vertex, you can imagine connecting to something like the planet and the larger vertex, the upper vertex connecting to something like a star. 
that is a good beginning practice, but of course the Merkaba is also a tool for interdimensional and time travel. So you can also change those imaginings of connectivity. The part of the limitations of the teaching of the Merkaba and that it was passed down from mystery traditions is that it kind of was initially taught like running on a hamster wheel. You just create this spinning thing and just stay within it, just keep on running on your hamster wheel, kind of a little bit limiting, maybe even intentionally with the sense of not wanting humans to fully be activated in terms of being able to transform your Merkaba, six pointed structure tetrahedron into an octahedron. Because I got the camera over here, let me show you. This little crystal is an octahedron. So it is, I'll hold it up close to the camera so you can see and let's see if it'll, well, that's a pretty good, um, a uh, picture of it. Um, you can see that it has a square shape. And then you can also see one, two, three, four sides up there, one, two, three, four sides over there. And then it has this square presence, as opposed to the tetrahedron shape that has a triangular base of the pyramid. What you do, so the Merkaba can be used for protection. It can be used for manifestation. That's number two. First thing is get an immune system. Make sure that only the stuff you want inside of you is inside of you so that nothing is polluting or unduly influencing. Let me just drink a little bit more. Patricia is saying active principle and receptive principle. Yes, I applaud, you totally get it. Um, and I know you've been in the class before, so you're, you're already you know, moving at a fast rate. Um, when you are performing reality creation with something like the Merkaba or with something like the flying rainbow lasagna, the first thing you want to do is make sure your immune system is going energetically so that you don't have any undue influences. You know, you can have your own personal trauma that you might not want to recreate or reverberate into the world, but then you can also have hitchhikers and ride-alongs and pathogens, and things that come inside of you that are like, hmm, I see you're creating reality. I want to be a part of that. It looks like fun, but it's like, no, 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 no. Like you're not that healthy and you should not be creating reality right now. Understand that reality creation requires radical levels of personal responsibility and accountability. In our lives, we need to move through the time field and understand I am creating time. I am in divine co-creative partnership. I am emanating time waves. I'm collapsing time waves with my observership. I am making events in reality. I'm making things happen. And although one cannot take into total personal responsibility until one achieves a total level of empowerment, it is a really good practice to say, if something manifests in your life, what did I do personally to contribute towards that manifestation? Often there, there is an answer of, oh, I thought this thought or did this thing or did this, but sometimes the answer is it was beyond your control, so please don't be too um, self-responsible. But understand when you get to the real levels of virtuosity, like if you are playing the piano of reality and you're like, oh, my pinky slipped, I might make the wrong note, um, don't die, don't jump out the window, you're gonna be okay. But you recognize like, oh, like that was, that was a mistake, that was a little bit wrong. And then there are repercussions, but also where's my pencil and the eraser? Pencils have erasers. You're in the art studio of your life. So I'm a visual artist and a big part of my drawing process is, you know, this is a pencil. It's not permanent indelible ink yet. Initially I start off and I'm like, oh, I'm drawing. It looks like this, it looks like this. No, totally wrong, totally wrong. Get the eraser, erase that out, erase that out. So understand that in reality creation, I encourage everyone to also begin with quote unquote, rough sketches of reality working in pencil or a mutable form, something that is not indelible and structured with no change. And to understand that you also have the capacity to rewind, to draw back, to draw back in, to change, to rescind, to edit, to mandate, to say, I want that to be different. I don't quite like it. So you can, you can erase the whole thing, etch a sketch, shake the etch a sketch, shake, re erase the whole thing, or you can erase part of it that's edit it. You can. That's part of your job as a as an artist, and to make these aesthetic, and conscious, and responsibility based choices. And also in the level of reality creation and higher dimensional perception, these two things go hand in hand. Like I was mentioning in the silly cartoon show, having the eye of time functional to be able to see the end results of what you're painting or drawing. So initially the rough sketches of your mind might be like, I wonder what would happen, I'm sketching here with my mind, if I did blah, 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 blah. And then I look down the time tunnel, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that, this thing is gonna screw up over here. No, no, erase away, erase away, erase away. No, blah, 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 blah. We're not gonna have that, we're not gonna have that. We're gonna go in this direction instead. What, what about with this? So a good example would be something like apartment hunting. You're looking through the listings, look, and you're like, ah, 
here's a listing. What, here's a rough sketch. What would it be like if I chose that listing? And you kind of look down the time tunnel and you're like, oh, terrible, 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 terrible. We're going to hate it. Or, you know, something, there's something wrong. The place is filled with mold. I didn't know it. Uh, erase it away. That's not really the right place for me to live. Or bad neighborhood. I've had a lot of that. Like listing looks great. Possibilities. I'm imagining myself putting my whole life inside of this apartment or place to live. And then I go there. And I'm like, oh, terrible neighborhood. Hate the feeling. Hate the vibe. High crime erase it away. We don't want to live there at all. And understand that it is the loving and accommodating cosmos. You're not going to get like smashed down like you wanted to live there and now you have to eat your broccoli. You know, I'm making a mean face. Here's mean as I can. I can't really make a mean face. But me eat your broccoli. You wanted to live that. You manifested that. That's this whole idea of punishment and, and um, retribution and this very you know, it's almost a Judeo-Christian idea of a punishment God that's like, how dare you? You wanted to do something and you were wrong. Now you will be smited and punished as opposed to like a loving presence where it's like, oh, I see that you wanted to do that. Are you really sure you want to choose that apartment to live in? It's a terrible neighborhood and I think you should reconsider it. And then you reconsider it. It's like, good, good job. You know, like you kind of like pat, pat the kid on the cheeks, like, good job. Like you really didn't want to live there after all. Like let's erase that all away. Let's start again. Um, I'm much more believing in and aligning with the second characteristic characterization of what the cosmos is like, because our lives being happy and healthy, fulfilled and abundant are reflections of and contributors to the larger context, meta universe, meta cosmos, being happy, abundant, and healthy. So this goes back to Phoenix Rising's question about having enough money. Many of us wonder and question about this, and I encourage us to do so and claim leadership in terms of money and sharing money abundantly with others. When you buy something from someone else or they do a service for you, pay them abundantly. Booyah. Take that money. It, you did a good job. And when you do something good, be like, yeah, pay me. I did a good job. That um, That's how, how we should be with all of this. When we are abundant and happy and healthy, we are adding to the larger health of the superstructure. That is something that the cosmos actually wants for us, just like being well-fed and well-nourished in your body. I'm very big on that concept too, of being able to access and afford the best uh, type of food, like organic and healthy food, which we know is more expensive and more difficult to find or create. And also putting enough of it into your body so that you're well, it's, it's, it's like anything, like it's difficult to paint a masterpiece painting when you are literally starving as an artist, your brain doesn't function as well, creativity doesn't function as well, being abundant and well fed is a big part of this. So um, yes, but divine partnership and respect for all these things. So let's talk about, um, like Patricia mentioned, active principle and receptive principle. The Merkaba is and can be used for manifestation. That's number two on the list of things you can do with it. Immune system, then we're gonna actually manifest and create stuff with it. The active principle of pointing upwards where the there's like a fat, a, a face plate, not fat, a flat plane, kind of like a windshield in front of your body and you're sitting within your pyramid. And I often use this the example, like you want to manifest something like, you know, ice cream, because I just think that that's a good example to, to use. So, so wait, hold, hold on a moment. You're like, okay, I want a specific flavor. Like I want to have whatever, che cherry chocolate ice cream. And I want to have it in a blue dish and I want to eat it with a silver spoon and I want to have it on Tuesday. And those are all the specifics that you put into there. And it's good to be specific because you, you get what you ask for in life. Then there's also the receptive principle, which is like a cup that fills up. And where you say in a more intuitive sense, I want something like a reward. Or I'm just going to ask people to mute themselves just because it helps in terms of um, the recording, not having um, distractions in the background. But please unmute yourself when it's time to speak and ask questions. Um, when you are receptive, you're like, I want something that's like a reward, something that's special, maybe something that you eat on a hot summer day that, you know, feels this or that, and that is sweet. And then it, the reality expression that you end up experiencing is a combination of both of these things put together. Your dynamic specific requests to the cosmos and the intuitive, receptive, being open to dealer's choice or being open to the chef's choice in, a, in the restaurant of the cosmos, that you then get a combination of two of these things and it involves some unpredictability and some surprises. Sometimes the catch of the day is even better than anything that you thought. Like when you go to the restaurant and you're like, yeah, chef's choice. 
You're like, give me what's good in the kitchen because you know what's fresh and you know what's excellent. You can say that to the cosmos. You can say, give me what's good, but also you should be specific because if you're like, but I hate fish, it's just like, there's just no fish or just no of this. I'm vegetarian or none of this. So you should be really specific. So if you're like, you know something, I want a new place to live, but maybe you're like, I want to make sure that I'm, you know, on this type of a neighborhood where there's sidewalks where I can walk my dog, then be specific about that. Or, you know, whatever, I want to be in this location for this purpose, or I want to have this feature. I want to make sure that there's a big window with sunlight coming in. Be specific about those things, but then also be receptive. And then also you might surprise yourself in your accommodation because the thing that you get instead of ice cream might end up being gelato. The might end up being instead of on a Tuesday, it might be on a Thursday. Instead of in a blue bowl, it might be in an orange bowl. Like you have to be open to these changes and understand that you're in a co-creative partnership, which is the fun and excitement of being in a jam band as opposed to only playing your own music and everything is according to the notes that are already pre, pre, predetermined. And it's a bit boring. It's deterministic. It's fatalistic, meaning it's fated. Things that are new and created. So the Merkaba is a dynamic creation principle between yourself and the cosmos. And the third thing that you can do with Merkaba, and I'll get more into this at, you know, in, in future classes because it is an expert thing, is to transform your star tetrahedron into an octahedron, this shape here, by rearranging the plates the facets of the material itself so that you are then able to travel interdimensionally. So when you get to that level of higher consciousness, super state thinking, instead of saying, I am making something happen, what you really understand it, what you're doing is you're spinning your Merkaba fast enough. You spin so fast that you're actually able to fly, quote unquote, from one timeline onto a different timeline where the ice cream that you desire exists. And I, I hardly ever eat ice cream, but I ate ice cream last night because I was in a place called Little Italy around here. And I thought that I wanted one kind of ice cream, but then I ended up getting a really different kind and it was wonderful. And so that's why I sometimes use that as my example. Let me go back to my pictures here and let me show you this one as a good example. Wait, wait. I wanna show everything to you. First, I'll show you this, then I'll show you this. And I know we're going over time a little bit, but I have the time. Anyone who needs to hop out, please understand that these will always be archived so that you can check it out later. What is going on? I just wanna find the things that I can say. No, ah, stop, hold on. I don't mean to frustrate you. I just need to find the annotation. This is the first thing. There we go. Sometimes if I don't get the pen thing going right away, it's a little bit difficult. It doesn't pop up for me. So let's talk about first in this drawing of a person. First, you see this is kind of a high heart, but from energy center of the energy, the center of the energy field. Sometimes my brain is moving too fast for my mouth. Moving outward towards this vertex. That is the receptive heart. Heart is acceptance. Heart is love tone. Love tone. Love tone. Heart is love tone. That's like, you know something? Chef's choice. I ended up getting olive oil flavored ice cream. I didn't even know that existed, but it was wonderful. Um, I didn't know to wish for it, but I found it on the menu. And also the place I thought I was going to go was closed. So I went to a different place. Um, you, and usually I'm very health food centered. So eating ice cream is a super treat for me. Um, that one that sticks out from the heart like this, I spin around to the left, okay? And then there's one that sticks out from the sacral plexus and sacral is your sacrum. It's the area, I should use the word pelvis. It is right above your pelvis where the base of your spine goes into the butterfly shape of your, of your pelvis area, your, pel your pelvic bone. And that fits outward to this vertex over here. And I spin that vertex going around in this direction. I want everyone to begin practicing this or, or I now I want. I suggest or request or invite and encourage you as a flying rainbow lasagna teacher to practice this because it's a very effective shield. It's an effective immune system. And I think it will serve you incredibly well in your levels of spiritual development. Um, just being able to create that balanced stabilizing structure is a virtuous practice, virtuous virtu virtuosity, becoming like uh, a player in the symphony of life to be able to do that. It's making good music. So it's very effective to do that and will help you on your journey. 
um, let me change to a different viewpoint of what Merkaba is. And this one has to do with number three. And let me also say to you that I have a video that I will share in your homeworks link. I wanted to move this thing over to the side. Okay, I hope you can see it. It's over, it's I'll skew on my screen. I hope it's in the center of your screen. I have a homework link that I will send to everyone that is all about what this looks like because of anime, it's an animation. Animation is worth a million of my flapping moving mouth parts. So yeah, worth a million words. Um, this is, first let's count up the, the sides so that you know how many sides are there, right? Okay, one, two, three, and there's four in the back that you can't see, one, two, three, four. And then in the other one, I'll erase those. So we're up to four, five, six, seven, and then eight is the bottom. So you have eight sides in all of this. It's like saying you have eight puzzle pieces. We're not adding or taking away anything, but we are rearranging. And the way that you rearrange this structure into an octahedron is by first envisioning that you are, uh, was not, that was a crap line. Don't worry, don't jump out the window. You can fix it later. And part of my thing is off the screen. So just imagine I've drawn the line with the left. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, I'm going to, that was also not a good line. Sometimes my aim is really off with this digital pen. Try again. There we go. Now, a few more lines to make. This one and this one. Okay. So you have a shape that is similar to that little crystal that I was holding up to the screen. Where's my thing? You still have eight sides, but now you have eight sides that are like a pyramid. That is like the pyramid at Giza that has a square base. I'm going to count the sides for you. I'll change the color now. Okay. Side one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven and eight is around the back. You still have eight sides, but you have changed them in their arrangement. And the video shows it very, very well. You get, you get these two vertexes, you get this one spinning around this way, you get this one spinning around this way, and it makes kind of a blurred shape. Then you get this beautiful energy presence that goes up and down the center of your spine and the center of your being like that. It connects it all together. Then Kapow, you pop into an octagon, octahedron shape. This is the greatest um, advanced level. I say greatest, like requires, the, it's a, the hardest symphony to play. So you turn your star tetrahedron into one of these octahedron shapes like this. That is what allows you to be able to transport yourself interdimensionally. So we'll put that on as like the Con concert that we're studying for, all right? So focus on number one and number two, moving up to number three. Um, Melissa says, using the Merkaba is like bribing Mr. Psychosomatic to cross the border. I love this. Because just the practice of using Merkaba alone gives you a sense of security, good feelings, grazing on greener pastures. You feel and therefore act more confident and receptive. Beautiful way of putting it. Let me just drink a bit. So using the Merkaba is the first part of responsibly beginning to do the flying rainbow lasagna. So I, this is day one of class. Even though for people who are level two, flying rainbow lasagna is a familiar concept. Uh, first, I need to describe much, much more of what this is. But understand that that practice of creating a protective energy field around you and then learning to create a balanced giving and receiving of your desires and what the cosmos reflects back to you in terms of your fulfillment of desires is a substrate or the beginning practices of your twinkling of the piano for doing the flying rainbow lasagna dance. And this dance is a dance of your DNA. As I've described, DNA is a bridge of light, a bridge that has a dance movement of oscillations and um, complex transformations that go um, combining the potentials of your somatic cellular world and what we're experiencing here in terms of I'm on a particular timeline in a particular reality with the abstractions of the force field of light and time that surrounds your physicality. So right now we are swimming through a sea of time. 
I'm swimming along. I'm swimming along with all of you. We're like a school of fish, all everybody's or dolphins, we're all dolphins, because dolphins do that cool kind of jumping together like sine waves type of thing. We're a beautiful pod of dolphins that are all moving along together. Um, and we are um, on the one hand, physicality structures, and that would be like the dolphin presence, but we are also non-physicality energy force fields. And that would be like the oceanic presence of energy that we are swimming through. DNA is the bridge, behavioral bridge between these two aspects of self. When we're talking about making stuff happen in reality, what you're really talking about is a bunch of vibrating strings called your DNA and also your, your wave field are vibrating reality. That's the potentials of reality. And then those potentials of reality are solidified and experienced by us, the reality experiencing apparatus that is known as the physical human body. All of this is absolutely, you could call it miraculous, supernatural, so unlikely that it becomes uh, whatever, a celebrated event of unlikelihood. Like that's what I would consider to be miracle. Like every moment of your day is miracle. It is so unlikely that you have a body apparatus, that time exists, that you're able to even doing something boring. Like I sat in my room and whatever, drank a glass of water, like ho-hum, like how boring. And just looking at that. But all of those things are miraculous events. Water exists at room temperature. You're able to hydrate yourself with it. You're able to you know, be in a third dimensional box known as a room. You're able to have a body and metabolize and respirate. And you're able to move through moments of time. These are all miraculous events. And that's just in the sense of having a mundane experience or nothing that is that out of the ordinary, according to human definition. Then when we get to the idea of consciously creating or manifesting or aligning with certain realities, it would be like saying, my DNA is doing this particular dance and then I wanna be in a different direction or doing something different. What if I can change what I'm doing with my DNA or change the way that these strands that connect me to time are moving that allow me to go into a new and different direction in time. And that's what reality creation is really about. So I actually just use my hands to kind of autonomically do a little FRLing. And I say FRL is the shorthand for flying your lasagna because it's so long. Um, to me, FRL is an autonomic experience um, breathing is autonomic. That means you do it just like an app that's running in the background, like you're always breathing, but you can also do conscious breathing where you're like, maybe you play the flute and you're intentionally like, now I'm breathing in, now I'm breathing out or yogic breathing. You can control it consciously with your mind, but a lot of the time it's just going, it's just running and doing its thing. That is what flying rainbow lasagna is like. For me, it is constantly going, constantly going on a cellular level, constantly dancing and doing these patterns and new chords and new patterns and new oscillations. And I'll describe more about what it is in terms of this violet structure and the singularity or infinity point ju jumping and what makes that jump, this is for future classes, um, but know that it's always happening and that even just being in the presence of someone who's doing it affects you. Just like if someone is playing the guitar, that music washes over you and it, goes into your ears and it vibrates your diaphragm and the bottoms of your feet like you feel music you can feel frl when it is being done in your presence even non-locally so you might before you even took this class have felt the frl vibrations emanating outward at large from me like i'm in my zone i'm doing my dance i'm flying everything all around and i know that what i'm sending out is heard and experienced and affected by other people that also have DNA. This is the phenomenon of sympathetic vibration. I'll get into more of that on later classes too. Um, and that's also issues of consent and all of that. But when you dilate, Char Charlie B made this excellent um, point in a different discussion. He was like, you know, if you dilate back to the point of understanding the quantum entanglement of all light, all light is you, you identify with all light and then these issues of consent just evaporate. And so that's actually very truthful. So the question of being an individuated person where it's like, may I fly rainbow lasagna and influence your DNA? How do you feel about that? Are you okay with this? Or do you want to run away screaming? Um, <laughs> and versus the idea that all of us are intimately connected as beings of light and that the time 
and consciousness that are flowing through you is actually the time and consciousness that's flowing through me, that's flowing through the larger superstructure. That's really the cosmic truth um, that, that we all live and that we all embody. So please, please know that. But then also, but also, and I'm being extremely socially sensitive these days about asking for specific verbal or intentional consent. Be like, do you want this energy to come inside of you? If so, yes, then I will do this in your presence. But it affects the world just to do it. Um, vibrating your DNA in new and interesting patterns that basically what that does is create a bridge between the outside manifested world and the inside world of pure potential. Your inside world, quote unquote, would be called the world of emotions, thoughts, passions, desires, dreams, um, all that cannot be weighed on a scale or measured with a measuring tape. And then there's the outer world, which is the world of, you know, quantum, uh, sorry, objective observership, um, materialism. Like I can take this and I can put it on a scale and I can weigh it, it weighs this many ounces, or I can take a picture of it with a camera, can measure it with a measuring tape, all of those things. Science is very happy and comfortable with. Hooray, things I can see and measure and touch with my five senses. Other things inside of you, like how much does your anger weigh? I don't know. How much does your soul weigh? We don't know these answers to these questions. These are not tangible items. The flying rainbow lasagna has as its end result, the manifestation or at making outside the stuff that is inside because these become interconnected or communicative surfaces. And that is a transformative experience. So it is everything about transforming your inner world into your outer world and then back into your inner world as a feedback loop. It's a little bit different, different flavor than what Merkaba is where you do have inner desires and things like that, but then you are in a partnership with the larger structure that is outside of you. And then you are kind of um, equalizing out to the, the end result of what, what happens as an end result of that partnership. This still involves partnership. It involves the vibrating back and forth between singularity that is inside of what you would define as individual self-state and singularity that is outside of what you would define as individual self-state. I now bring forward my magical silk scarf, like a magician. I pull it out of my sleeve, magical silk scarf. This is the representation of the fabric of time, space, and consciousness. And this fabric is the fabric of time. And there are singularity points all throughout it. So let's say this little point where I'm pointing my finger, that's a singularity point. And let's say this point over here is also a singularity point. And it looks like, wow, like this one is in a person over here and this one is in a star over here. And it looks like they are 93 million miles away. However, what is actually happening is fabric of time, space, and consciousness is bringing everything together. Flying Rainbow Lasagna brings everything together. The convergence point where all of these singularities overlap means that the distance, the perceived distance between everything here becomes a big giant non, I'm not losing my word. Um, it becomes irrelevant, it becomes an irrelevance that it looked like these things were this far apart, but they're not this far apart. They're actually this close together. 93 million miles becomes an irrelevancy. And what really matters is the real truth that all of the singularity, there's not multiples, there's only one that exists in all these different dimensional and time spaces is actually the same singularity. It's that central convergence point from level one where the chakras all converge at the center of that human form. It is the zeroth dimension. It is infinity, it is the presence of all energy. When you are that singularity point, you are everything that has ever existed or has the potential to ever exist. And it is all overlapping in that one spot. So it is a grand scale identification as self with everything. And when you really embody that truth, it becomes very profound and it then allows you to collapse the distance between things that are seemingly far apart into having no distance between them at all. So it might appear as if you are vibrating the singularity that is within you with something like the singularity that is at the center of the sun or at the center of a planet or inside of another person or in a person that's an ancient person. This vibrating back and forth um, supersedes time. It renders time irrelevant. Time is a thing that distances people. It says, this is a million years ago and this is now, and that's a long way away in time. 
But when you vibrate the singularity, what you're able to do is say, no, actually both of those singularities exist in the same exact spot and there's no distance between them. There's no time distance between them. And when you do it in terms of space, like here's me and here's the sun, 93 million miles. But what I do is I bring them both together and I say, no, there is actually no space. There is no space between me and the sun. There is just the singularity that is overlapping. It becomes a, a unity consciousness. And in that unity consciousness, there is a creative partnership and a creative manifestation. It's a different level of creative manifestation than the Merkaba. Um, so the question that Phoenix Rising had about, can you do FRL to manifest money? Yes, you can. But what really happens is in your spiritual practice of becoming a greater and greater genetic virtuoso to gain the capacity to do the FRL dance, your motivations change, your personal levels of integrity skyrocket, your levels of perception also skyrocket, where you start to understand the um, ramifications of everything you do. So it's not just like that guy in the cartoon, he's like, I wanna use my time crystal to be able to find a girlfriend. You are like, well, I have this ego desire, but if I fulfill it in this way, this will happen. There you go, thank you for muting yourself. We'll unmute in a moment for questions. If I do this thing, this will happen. If I do this thing, this will happen. All of that matters in terms of what am I reverberating outward. So you are able to achieve greater levels of personal responsibility, even while you are achieving greater levels of perception. These two things go hand in hand. Like if you're totally blind, you can't paint a painting. You kind of are like feeling around, like you can't make something that looks good. So the capacity to see the future. And when you see the future, you don't just see one future. This is a big part of becoming multidimensional. So you don't just see, I'm on this timeline, I'm here, I'm going down the road and I'm gonna end up at from point A to point B, linear. Here's my screen, point A to point B. No, it is more like a radial dandelion spoke or a multi-branching, multi-branched um, uh, array where you begin to see all of these different possibilities where you see the future, not only of point A to point B, but you also see a whole, spreading out array of point A through Z through 10 million, through, F, through epsilon, through zeta, you know, every language, every alphabet of every language spreading outward from point, point A into the potentials of all of these other timelines. And then from that viewpoint of totality perception to be able to determine what pathway you would like to take. And also there's always the capacity if you're like, I see all of the options and I don't like any of the options. That's like checking the rental listings. Like I see all of these apartments, I see all these houses. I don't like any of these houses. And it's acceptable to then say in my totality state, seeing all these possibilities and probabilities, I want to generate something new. That is the real genius of flying rainbow lasagna. The capacity to write something completely new, unpredictable, into the reality structure or potentials of your life. So at one point you can think of it, uh, uh, a certain aspect of capacity comes from just being able to navigate what is already predetermined. And then if you do not like, let's say, I don't like any of these recorded songs. I don't like any of them. I wanna jazz. I wanna make something new. I wanna spontaneously write new music in the moment. That is what Flying Rainbow Lasagna truly is about. So when I created Flying Rainbow Lasagna, I created some jazz in the moment that allowed for a totally new possibility. That was the possibility that instead of this body dying metabolically and going into decomposition and becoming a corpse, something else could happen because I didn't like any of the possibilities. I'm like, I don't like that possibility. And I don't like that possibility. All bad, 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 no, 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 no. Don't like it, don't like it, don't like it. So I invented Flying Rainbow Lasagna as a way of writing a new possibility and creating something new. And then I also, as the creator of something new, have to take responsibility for the repercussions, both positive and negative, of that creation act. And that is what you know my, my embodiment here is all about. And I do not have any regrets. And I'm constantly fine tuning and adding more layers to the masterpiece, which is the idea, like when you're painting oil painting, you do not traditionally do it all in one day. Real oil paintings are done with first a pencil sketch, then layers of washes that are very clear, then more and more and more paint as paint dries, you add more layers, 
And then eventually the form starts to come forward and then more details are added and you make, like, let, let, let layers dry and add more colors. That is what the flying rainbow lasagna is. It is a cumulative dance over time. What science is now beginning to explore and call a time crystal or multiple laminated layers of experience seen up through time, but when you then actually see the totality of it all stacked up together. I will get into this concept more when I talk about dimensionality from the zeroth dimension up to the 10th dimension. So don't worry, this is an introduction first day of class. But understand that you're not expected to be like, okay, dance the flying rainbow lasagna, you're going to make a new reality and boom, it's done. It's not like that. It is much more like you created the first layer of potential of reality today. And then tomorrow you're going to dance another layer into being. And then the next day you dance another layer into being. Your body and your, your embeddedness in time becomes a time sculpture. You could imagine a, a superimposition like a superimposed image where like, here's me yesterday and I'm doing my dance. And then here's me today and I'm doing my dance. And then here's me today and I'm doing my dance. And I've done my dance over 20 years. So that's 20 years of daily laminations or layers of this dance where I've created different things, of course, in partnership with the cosmos and fine tuned the reality. Cause I'm like, I don't like that part. Erase that part out. That part wasn't working or Sometimes it is about rearranging something that doesn't work over there, rearrange it over here. And then moving into um, you know, the present level. Like when I realized I've been here for 20 years and I've been doing this dance for 20 years, that was like this past October, it's pretty amazing. Like there is a definite crystalline structure, which is the sense of so many overlapping oscillation, moving things. At a certain point, you have so many movements and so many things like that. It looks like something that is a static crystal, but you understand that it is made of all of these waveforms and oscillations. So I'll do also just very basically that there are these different movements, like there's an up down, there's a side to side, there's an in and out, there's a tumbling end over end. And from those basic movements, you can weave together all of these different um, possibilities in your DNA. And I often use this movement as like a coming together a page break, a pagination, or a measure break in music, where you do like dance, 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 a thing is happening, a thing is being created, and then a pagination. That's its own um, um, part partitioned level of reality. And now on to the new chapter. Now we dance a new thing into being, where that song is done. Now we dance a new thing into being. Big things in terms of Merkaba and flying rainbow lasagna and reality creation creating from a place of balance and partnership with the cosmos, having an energetic immune system so that you are creating without having something else hijack your creation. Your body and your DNA vehicle are sacred to you. Like your fingernail, your, sorry, your fingerprints are unique to you. This is your body. You own it. You're in your life. You own it. What you create is also, you own it. It shouldn't be that anything else is being like, oh yeah, like I got into your mind and it influenced you and then I got you to do this thing. Like none of that is supposed to be what's going on. What is supposed to be going on is the your own joyous um, exploration of what it is to be embodied in time and what it is to have these opportunities because I'm very much a, a believer in personal freedom as opposed to determinism. Determinism is where everything is already written. It's like fate. This is going to happen, and this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and you just like, go through your paces and experience it, which is rather disempowering and maybe a bit upsetting. Like, I don't like these things that are going on, and I don't want to just experience them like a bump on a log. I want to actually do something and make things better. That is a much more empowered state, a much more spiritually mature state, and also requires a lot more. It's personal freedom. It's also personal responsibility and personal accountability because you can't just um, kick the football higher and be like, oh, not, not my fault, not my job. I'm just uh, fated to experience this. I'm just a deterministic, fatalistic person. And that, that the man upstairs made it happen. And someone else you know, wrote this story. And I'm just a stupid guy down here drinking coffee and kind of you know, do, doing my day. Um, that's a very disempowered state, not as much fun, not as participatory, and not as personally responsible. Some things are outside of our control. I definitely recognize that. When we move into levels of virtuosity, we recognize many things are in our control. And then other things are sometimes reverberations of self-state from a higher self-state or part of a larger context that we created before we incarnated as this being. So sometimes we're dealing with consequences from decisions that we made in a different life, in a different scale of life, 
like you might have been living on a galactic scale and now you are living on a human scale and the things that you decisions that you made when you were part of a galaxy are now influencing you and you're living here or the things that were made in ancient concurrent Atlantis are influencing you as you are here now. So understand that that's the multidimensional viewpoint to see all of these things are factors that are contributory to your present self state and also taking responsibility for the things that you did when you were at that level that they're affecting you now. Understand that it's in unity consciousness, you are all self state affecting self state, including those that have violenced you, including those that have harmed you or uh, whatever, you know, limited you or done done things to you that you feel are malevolent. That's also self state, which can be all again difficult to claim when you're down in it, swimming in the river, but when you are up above it, um, things make a lot more sense. So all of this, I'm, I'm about to wrap up level two because I'm getting to the end of my time. Like I could talk about this for a very long time. Let me say this. Um, I encourage everyone to access the stuff that's on Teachable because I go through a very um, detailed explanation of all that I've spoken about here and more information too, especially about Merkaba and how it transforms from um, uh, hexagon and star tetrahedron into octagon and a greater levels of um, experience in that way, I will send out as a homework, the Merkaba video. So access the recorded lessons of level one, lesson one, access the recorded lessons of level two, lesson two. If you're a total beginner, you can do both levels at the same time. I don't know if it'll be overwhelming to you, if it will be too much lasagna at once. You know your own brain, like don't, don't blow your circuits, go in sensible increments. If you've already done level one, now do level two. And understand that this is all one room schoolhouse so that you, I encourage everyone like be exposed to the advanced lectures also, because I think that will inspire you and um, be part of the discussion. Now I'm opening the floor for anyone to have um, questions about what I was just talking about for the level two stuff. And then I'm going to do uh, complete this recording and then do a QA and a uh, for things that are uh, recorded for Vimeo. So please raise hands or unmute to be able to, or speak in the chat to be able to ask questions and scrolling through to see if anyone has anything to say. And if not, oh, Lucy, Lucy, so wonderful to see you. Please unmute, great to see you and thank you for being here. Do you need me to unmute you? Do you know how to work things? Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm just, I'm doing other things, so I don't want to be too. Um, Hi, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much. So, my question is, as we do this, because you know, I used to do it, and I haven't in a while. I have a standing desk, so excuse me. Um, are we not alerting? Be they entities? Be they? past lives from different timelines that we're doing this work. And just by protecting ourselves when we enter the Merkaba, I mean, this is making an effect. No, do you, you know what I'm trying to ask here? I think so. Ask a little bit more because I, I think I need a little bit more direction from you. You know, as you seek the light, the dark knows you're seeking the light. Moths to a flame, yeah. So that this work, what is the protection we need? Because our little Merkabas are very wobbly. I never could do the left and the right. It, I really slow. It's not that easy and it takes a lot of work. I understand. And okay. while we're doing that work, are we vulnerable? Yeah, there are, I will be honest with you. Strong, it's a, you know, our wings are not strong swimming in the ocean. There are leviathans out there. There are toothy sharks out there. Like, I will not lie to you. I'm a very responsible teacher. It's why I teach about the Merkaba for protection. So please understand that uh, we're a pod of dolphins. It is good to travel with your pod because there is some uh, assistance slash protection of ma many of us being together. Like you don't have to just do a soul um, migration all alone, like swimming along through the ocean of consciousness. Um, yeah, very, and very big, the support, love and protection can uh, be reciprocal and come from a group, come from other people. Understand that Merkaba for protection and other protections shielding. 
They do get stronger as you practice it more. There are also, I would say, positive presences that you can call upon. Um, light masters, those who are adults. Like if we are like little baby sea turtles and we just hatched, like we're newcomers, like kind of like I'm new, like my shell isn't even hard yet, I'm a little tiny thing. Um, there are uh, ancient ones who have already made this migration that it's absolutely appropriate to align yourself with, ask for assistance from, ask for positive influence by that you could consider that to be part of like soul community or light community. Because again, unity consciousness, that this is all part of really desiring for self-state as newcomer to succeed, even as established self-state is on its journey moving forward. And that really is the information that informs my journey as Aurora. I am self-state in Aurora Collective's um, perspective of having already graduated, like I'm already quite mature. And I'm also very much caring about everybody who's new baby sea turtles that just came out of the shell. And I'm like, get, get across the, like, don't get eaten by a seagull, get in there, like get in the ocean, get in the ocean, do your soul migration. Um, that's a big part of why I'm here, actually using mouth talking, actually sharing these ideas, because I really do care about and am intimately invested in your journey at this level, because your journey at this level also radiates outward, upward in the ramifications of what happens out there. So do your own protection as much as you can. Traveling with others is also good. And calling upon those mature presences who have already transcended this level of, what would you say, the lessons in the schoolhouse and moved on to grad school and other things like that. They care about you a lot. No one is, no one is like this. That's it, kids. Like, I'm out of here. Like, you know, like, ah, I'm over here. I'm over it. Like, do your thing, kids. Like, I'm gone. It's not like that at all. It's much more like, oh, wow, like I see that is happening to you and that is happening to you. And I care about that and I care about that. They care about things, but they act differently than the being embedded in time, but they are very much active and present in wanting to help us in our journey. And that there's also a balance between personal freedom and boundaries and you're taking responsibility as yourself. So all of that is also balanced state because you can be like, hey, somebody like magic wand, magic wand, like somebody wave your magic wand and poof, like do this for me. And there's part of that, but then there's also the sense of, us growing the muscles, us transcending, us doing the work. So know that the work is inevitable in its success. That means your soul migration, you successfully reach the place you are going to go. It is inevitable. It is going to happen no matter what. However, you might go through a labyrinth. You might go through crazy experiences. You might go through literal hell or have something really uh, difficult or painful happen to you. Like I have to be honest about that. So the real truth is, Keep on doing the protections as much as you can and also reach for and ask for protections from that which is higher already established or more mature than you. Know that you get better at things the more that you do it, just like playing the piano, you get better the more that you do it. And don't be afraid as a newcomer baby sea turtle to manifest reality. Like I think that many people are greater in, in their potential than they actually know about themselves. And sometimes it is those moments of adversity where you're like, rise to the challenge. When you find yourself in a moment of adversity, like if you were swimming through the ocean, it's like, oh my, a shark or something like that, you know something, rise to the challenge. Be like, yeah, you know something, I'm gonna face this, I'm gonna do this. Um, and a shark would be like your fear, whatever is the fear, uh, whatever is the in inhibition of the thing that is trying to stop it in manifesting reality or moving in a positive direction or creating the reality that you want to create. We face many inhibitions or inhibitory forces. And some of them I would consider to be shadows, like things that are the negative inverse of the light. And some of them I would consider to be distortion presences that maybe don't even need to be in existence at all. Like I would just describe some of them as false light or maybe just like random, random crapola, things that we don't really need. Like some things are things to learn from, some things are like random crapola. It's important to not project too much or project too much significance onto some things because some things are just like, that it is what it is. But in every sense, I think like you can make uh, an opportunity to learn from things. Like I've certainly learned from things that I've considered to be arbitrary, what random crap all it would be, uh, arbitrary, nonsensical, surrealistic, not part of the pristine system. And I will tell you that I get insulted when I'm like, 
That is not part of the pristine system. That is not what's supposed to be here. That's nonsensical. It's a non sequitur. It does not follow. It's illogical. I'll point out all the inconsistencies, like doing the math homework, like that part is wrong, and that part is wrong, and that part is wrong. And then I send it into the cosmic complaints department. I'm like, no, that is not the way it's supposed to be. But then also, like, I'm like, okay, now that I've complained to the cosmic complaints department, like, now I need to actually have an effective approach other than just being like unhappy or um, whatever petulant about it. So then that's a, a big thing too is uh, I was talking with someone about this. I was talking with um, Brooksy about um, the moral injury. Like when you're a very like moralistic person, you're like, these are the rules, it's the way it's supposed to be. I'm like, how come I'm in this cosmos? And like, there are rules that appear not to be followed and it seems very illogical and I get very unhappy. And how come this isn't, you know, like I'm about cosmic law and all these things and you can get very healthy, very um, personally insulted about it. And I understand and appreciate all, all of those um, responses. And also, so sometimes the lesson is what to do through, uh, how to respond to a seemingly unfair situation or a seemingly impossible situation where it's like, that's not supposed to be like that. And it's never supposed to happen, but it's happening. What do you do? What do you do? Rise to the occasion, always rise to the occasion. Send in the cosmic complaints department, but also rise to the occasion. Um, and uh, in reality creation, um, I think that you also build more muscles the more that you do it. Like success breeds success. Like, uh, you know, my first paintings weren't even that good, but I kept on going and then I got better. And then my paintings, I think, became better and better. And so the point is like, keep going with all of these practices, even as a reality creation beginner. Don't be too concerned about, oh no, like what if I play a wrong note? Like my shoulders go down. Like, what if I play a wrong note and this bad thing happens and this and that? Don't don't go into those levels of um, um, concern or let's say um, what is it like when you feel less than what you actually are. Um, go into a state of confidence where you're like you know something I'm a beginner I don't know everything I will learn as I go and you're a worthy participant like that's a big part of it is understanding like you're in the band you're in the cosmic symphony you're a worthy participant um, it, you know don't don't fall into the pitfall of being like I'm the best with like you're still learning like don't fall into the ego trap but don't fall into the ego trap that's the other side which is I'm just not good enough to even start and like somebody else just do it like I'll just listen no like we really do need active participants and that's a big part of it so I'm encouraging everyone like be an active participant and also um you do get to erase you do get to rectify um a big part of cosmic maturity is admitting to mistakes and that is truthful at any level of um, development, the ownership of mistakes. So as a cosmic collective, my Aurora collective, it can be like, oh, what a grand mistake or what a questionable life decision that was, or look at that negative repercussion that happened and I'm smiling, but you can tell that it's like, oh, that can be actually very painful to see that that is going on. And then taking responsibility. I actually am a believer in the idea that there are many people embodied here right now in earthly experiences, in a physicality body, who are or were extremely advanced, like on the level of direct genetic creation, like genetic engineers from Andromeda and, you know, um, beings that lived in high levels of asc ascension and um, ethereal qu qualities. And that many of us are here, like kind of tying up loose ends to be like, yeah, like I did that thing in that other time state. I was very hugely powerful. I made a bunch of, I messed up or I made a bunch of messes. And now it is time for me to get a bucket and a mop and clean up the dirty footprints and clean up this and this because we're talking about reverberations through time. So when you do this thing over here, you do this thing up here and it's like, oh, and that all filtered down to hitting out dirty footprints down here. And now what am I going to do? So in many senses, my embodiment and coming here into a physicality structure is about what I'm going to do in terms of other decisions that I made in a larger super state structure. And I'm hyper responsible. I'm like, well, I'm going to actually go down there with a bucket and a mop and clean things up. So I think of flying the lasagna as a bucket and a mop type of tool for reality rectification. That's really what, that's really what this is. It is a waveform that is a rectification. So understand that high, higher self responsibility and accountability also means utilizing rectification tools where you admit I made a mistake. Now this part over here is crap. Now I'm going to create the cancellation waves how to erase or negate that, how to change or transform or shift that. And that 
is part of the cosmic journey also of taking responsibility. So um, yeah, doing self-protection, but understanding that sometimes uh, mistakes happen and then understanding that, that it's not the end of the journey. So you sometimes make mistakes that are errant and sometimes people make mistakes that are intentional. Like, yes, I was a bloodthirsty ax murderer. I'm being ironic. Bloodthirsty ax murderer and I chopped off those guys' heads and I did it, like I did it. Um, and to be like, then like, oh, I did that. And that's actually wrong and that's not good. What do I do now? This is big because there are people that have made horrific time experiments that kept people trapped in endless loops to time, time knots, time loops. All of these things have happened. What to do, what to do, like endlessly suffer? No, not endlessly suffer. Or someone who fell into a black hole and they're smeared on the singularity and they, they never actually get, you know, they never actually get flushed. They keep on just circling around. What do you do? Um, uh, the idea is that there is always a rectification event. So Lucy, have I, have I spoken well to your questions? Have I answered it? Yes, yes, more so because, um... I think of even you having dealing with this too, you yeah. know? I deal with it a lot, definitely. I mean, what I went through over the summertime and what I'm continually um, going through, I think that I deal with a lot of, some of them are shadow presences, some of them are negative presences, some of them are random crapola presences, and it can be a huge challenge, I think, especially in this world of transhumanism, and we'll get into that and when I do the other recording stuff. Um, about what is self-state, what is non-self-state, what is out there that's coming from divinity, what is stuff that is random signal, what is stuff that is malevolency, and all of those questions, and how is that affecting my emanation as a creative, you know, divine co-creative partner with my creative energy? How is that, how am I emanating that stuff? How am I exacerbating that stuff? How am I dealing with that stuff with, uh, ideally with compassion, I fall all the time. Like I'm always trying to be like, how can I understand this more? But sometimes I'm just like, blah, like I don't like this stuff and I don't want it to be there. So sometimes I'm just insulted by its presence and sometimes I want to fix it and heal it. Sometimes I, you know, I want to rearrange reality. So I recognize I struggle with these things very much and uh, I'm still, um, you know, seeking the answers, don't have all of the answers. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and we all are taking on a big responsibility here. You that's know? it. That's it. And it, it's an individual responsibility. In that's, the collective. that's part of the balance of Merkaba. It's part of the balance of higher dimensional super state. Like you balance what you what you are doing for yourself. I'm just getting a bit more water here. And also what you are doing for the larger body of light that you are embedded within. And sometimes what you do is I would say a devotion if not a sacrifice, like a personal martyrdom, because I don't really think that it's like that, but a devotion. Like when you're a devoted parent or a devoted pet owner, you're like, I will do anything to get my dog the best dog food. Like we'll drive an hour, we'll get her the best stuff. Um, you do it because you love them out of devotion. So it's not necessarily a sense of like, I will like cut off my feet and do something bad because I love someone, but it's more like a devotion to the cosmos to say, I will do what I need to do because I want to get that done because I love the larger body of light so much. That is really the definition of what my life and my existence here is about. Because I admit that it's challenging. Like it's challenging to be in this body. It's challenging to be in this social structure or energy structure or the way that the world has unfairnesses and um, presences that are unwholesome or things that you have to deal with or negativity. All of it, it's a rough gig. All these things are difficult. However, it is my behavioral love of the larger state that I live within that I'm like, I will do these things because it benefits the larger thing and it benefits me. So it's just like when you recognize like if you're part of a family and you serve the larger family, even if something is difficult or inconvenient to you, it gives to the family and the family gives back to you. That's what unity consciousness is and that's what it is to be part of this family of light structure. And that is what really motivates and informs my behavior. So then sometimes you do difficult things even if it is uh, inconvenient to you because it serves something larger. And I know I'm not the only person that is doing that in, in embodiment form here in this world, but there are many people who are practicing behavioral love or devotion to a larger ideal, like a, a set of ideas or intellect circumstances that like that is what is here informing behavior. And it's doing something more than just what is personally convenient. And that's what a lot of these, um, manifestation abilities are really about 
you know, if I say FRL is like a type of magic ability that is inside of me or inside of you as a dormancy that I'm, you know, encouraging and awakening inside of you, what would you do if you had a magical ability? You could use it just for yourself. You can also use it to really help other people in a lot of ways. And that's what I'm encouraged, that's what I embody and e exemplify and what I encourage other people to do too. And the way of helping other people is basically understanding in unity or identification with the totality as self, that what serves the totality serves the individuality and that eventually it ends up being incredibly worthwhile even if it is um, moderately like, inconvenient or difficult in in the in the moment in time so coming back here which this feel, being here now feels like to me like not coming backwards in time but diving into time when i was outside of the pool and be like i see a bunch of people doing stuff in the pool and bad stuff is going to happen i'm going to dive into the pool and do stuff so that things radiate outward and are different on the higher level circumstance and it's challenging to be here it's been challenging to be here for 20 years but it's worthwhile and things do get better and the things that we're doing here and this, even this conversation that we're having in this class shifts everything on a higher level and I feel a great deal of hopefulness and positivity because I know that things are being rectified and going in a better direction. And that if I hadn't made these choices and hadn't come here and do these things, that's really when I was seeing down the time tunnel, like if I don't act, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing happens. I'm sorry, I'm just turning off the phone so it doesn't interrupt our, our lesson here. Yeah, so sometimes the motivation to act is not only positive, like I wanna to move towards that thing, that thing, that thing that I wanna have happen. Sometimes it's like, if I don't do something, I see a crap future. You know, I'm being silly in my language, but I see many negative possibilities. And that is how I felt about um, what I saw with the death of this person and what motivated me to come into this life and create Flying Rainbow Lasagna and all of these teachings is that really inaction led to negative outcome. And what motivated me to do action was the sense that I had to be able to create a new reality of seeing something like, I don't like any of these possibilities. If I don't do something, something's gonna happen that's not okay to create a new reality so that it um, um, preempts those negative consequences. And that is often, like I say, when I say you're faced with an impossible situation or a fear or a Leviathan in the ocean that you're swimming in, rise to the occasion. Instead of being like, eh, like something bad is gonna happen, just like, Okay, go limp, don't do anything. Like, no, do something that even a untrained person or what you consider, you might consider yourself a small, whatever, a lone individual, um, don't give up or go limp. Definitely try to do something. And then you might even find that you are helped and supported and that su su super, super um, unexpected things happen. When I mean super, I mean like at this level, supra, higher level stuff happens even um, beyond what you might have thought. Sorry for all the dings and pings. Let me move on to one more question that's down here before I finish the recording. Um, Phoenix Rising is saying, um, light and consciousness are interchangeable. A light from a lamp also consciousness, even though it's artificial. Great question. Light from a lamp, let's say it's an oil lamp. The oil comes from a plant. It's solidified light from the sun. Let's say it's oil that comes from a petro petroleum uh, process. It's solidified ferns that were uh, from growing in the dinosaur time. Let's say that's light from whale oil. It's from whales that were alive. Let's say it's light from uh, candle wax from bees. That's from bees that are alive. So basically everything that we use as an artificial light source once came from the actual real light of our sun star. There's other things like an LED light. Is an LED light really alive and conscious? Electricity is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So electricity flowing in a wire does, in a very indirect way, originate from the sun as light. Electricity is light. But and also, the quality of light that comes from an LED light bulb is not the same, does not contain the same level of intelligence as the quality of light that comes from either an incandescent bulb or a candle bulb. And fluorescent light, I feel like it's terrible. Like I can't even bear to be in some of these stores that are all fluorescent lights. I'm like, ah, like this feels terrible. And also when you look at yourself under fluorescent lights, you're like, oh, like I look like a zombie. I look terrible because it's, it's very artificial light. It's false light. So understand that false light exists and it gives you a false view of what reality is. And um, I've dealt with a lot of false light in a lot of contexts 
So that's a really great, great question. And it also speaks to the idea of growing vegetables under false light. Like if you have hydroponic tomatoes or something like that, hydroponic cannabis, does it have the same intelligence in it as cannabis that is outside grown in the sun or nutrients that are grown in the sun? And I say, no, I say that it's really important to have the real sunlight get onto our vegetables and get into our bodies. And it's why I live in a very sunny climate. I'm very, very oriented towards the sun and towards real light. Um, TH is also asking me uh, another question. Hold on a second says, uh, hi, Aurora, beautiful point they're adding to the AI hijacking, the, the hijacking the immune system through a bioweapon. Let's talk about that in the stuff that I don't put up on YouTube. So thank you so much. I hope you'll be able to join us um, as I just continue the conversation. Like in five minutes, I'll just do a little bit more. TH asked me, Aurora, do we have a collective Merkaba? Booyah, yes, you do. Hold on a second. Let me do one more screen share before we end, because this is part of the level two lesson one stuff that I didn't quite get to. Let me just move this. This is a painting that I did that is called Vessel. That is a multiple Merkaba. There are, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's at least nine that are here collected up in this painting. It's a beautiful painting. Um, and it has a ton of texture and everything on it. I really love this one. The answer is yes. You have an individual protective reality creation mechanism and you can put it all together like puzzle pieces or um, tessellations, tilings with others. And you can create this, which is a living ship. And uh, I'll definitely speak about this more at length. The short answer is that a living ship is a vehicle that is just like your body is an organic presence where you have trillions of cells that all work together. And you're like, my trillions of cells are hungry and I need to drive to the store and you know, buy potatoes to feed my trillions of cells. That motivation means that all of your cells are like, yep, let's all get into the car. Let's all press on the gas pedal. Let's all respirate and share um, metabolic information so that we can successfully buy potatoes so that it feeds all of us. Because if your heart was like, no, no, I'm not going to the store for potatoes. You guys go out and get the potatoes. Like I'm gonna sit here and do this. That's not going to work because we need the heart to do stuff. And we also need this to do stuff. And we need this to do stuff. Everything has to work together. So each one of these individual energy presences is individual human or individual organism, I should say, a creature, an organism. They all fit together. They all are part of contribution of reality creation. And they must not be in conflict. They must be in concert because that is part of what leads to successful continued survival or creating the music of the cosmos, the symphony of life, so that you keep going. You buy your potatoes, you mash them up with your mouth crystals, you put them in your belly, you ferment them, and you stay alive another day. But of course, you know, we're moving into different levels of reality and I speak with irony and everything like that, but I use potatoes as an example. It's really about flying towards the realities that you want to be a part of. So us as a human collective, if I use the example, like we need to be like the um, individual cells and all choose to drive to the store and get food. We as a human species collective need to all be driving our collective car towards ways of treating our ecology with respect, our collective biology with respect, our economy with respect. Um, um, accommodating different levels of perspective and consciousness that these are all ways of integrating our song as opposed to being in constant conflict. And definitely war is part of that, even though people will be like, but Darwin and survival of the fittest and war is needed and all these things. I'm like, no, you know something, if your heart is at war with your spleen, these things both are not working together. You're never going to actually make it to the place where you buy your resources to be able to support everything. That's the story of human history. It's a story of human conflict get, uh, it's time to transcend. I wanted to say get over it, like get over it humans, but that's a little attitude. So let's say it is now time to transcend that level of um, inner conflict between humanity and itself in order to work together more effectively so that everybody gets the resources that they need so everybody can survive. So the group Merkaba, like my Aurora Collective, I'll go back to my face, let me drink a bit of water. My Aurora Collective, is a living ship. It is a consciousness presence that moves through vast levels of time, space, and consciousness. And we are not squabbling against each other. Like, I want to fly in this direction, but I want to fly in this direction. Like, no, I'm against you. I'm against you. Fight it out. It's not like that. It is more like, ah, 
Like you have your contribution towards consciousness and you have your contribution towards consciousness and we are all part of the same thing and it all must be mitigated and understood and respected. So I have to understand your motivations and why you want what you want and you understand my motivations, why I want what I want. It's like being in a romantic partnership where there's actual real communication you know, like you live with your spouse and it's like, well, I want to move to Texas. Well, I like California. Well, I want to stay here. Well, I want to do this. You can't just be like, fine. Like, let's just get divorced and fly off in different directions. You can't do that because one is the heart and one is the liver. And like, you have to work together because we need each other. So you have to find ways to communicate and to accommodate. And it actually, it's not about conflict or um, diminishment. It's actually quite joyful. It's like, oh, like you want to play that music? Fantastic. And I want to play this music. And that guy wants to play that music. And that there is a way in greater intelligence to fit all of these puzzle pieces together in order to have a greater totality experience, a greater whole. My collective is incredibly joyful. It's not like, oh, like I'm sour. Like we had to fly to this direction and that guy wanted it. And I, I'm mad at him because I had to, you know, I'm being so facetious in my attitude. No, it's more like total support. Like you need that, you need that. What is it like when you have a really great boss? He's like, okay, employees, what do you need? Like you need pencils, like you need a stapler. You need this, you need envelopes. Let's get you this and you this and you this. It's like a great leader is like someone who serves all of the needs of all of the individuals without having to have anybody be unhappy or you know, in, in a sense of um, uh, diminishment or anything like that. So that's really what my Aurora Collective is like. All of these different consciousnesses or levels of being that are all being honored and respected, all of their needs being respected, everything making its contribution, everything being accommodated in what it needs. And that's, that's successful survival on a very different level than like mere, whatever you would call it, Darwin survival, where it's like, I will fight you to the death. And then, you know, like to the pain, I will fight you. And then the only strong will survive. That is not what my collective is like at all. So I was very steep learning curve and understanding that whole perspective on um, what, what things are like here. Um, so um, Phoenix Rising says, wow, fantastic answer. False light is an interesting concept. I will start considering. Thank you for being my favorite teacher of all time. Phoenix Rising, thank you for that. That is the most gratifying, beautiful thing. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Adam is heading off. Thank you so much. This will all be archived for you. TH says, can we use it and inside it do our individual miracle bot? Yes. It just like working into in a really good company or a really well-oiled you know, organization, like a well-oiled machine. You do your thing. You are completely 100% yourself. Like whatever, if you're the drummer, like you do the drumming, you do the drumming, you do the drumming and everybody else plays their part. And you don't have to be like bass player, like do your thing, be on the beat. Bass player's on it, he's doing it. That's what my Aurora Collective is like. So you are self-responsible, even knowing that your self-responsibility adds up to the totality responsibility. Everybody is accountable to themselves and you're also accommodative of other people's needs, which is almost unimaginable in this competitive ego barbarian type world, but is the way that it really is in higher levels. Patricia says, thank you for your teaching. Good night all and enjoy your journey through time. Thank you. And Patricia, I will answer that question about um, AI and transhumanism in the upcoming segment. Um, Phoenix, thanks for a great class. She's going to see us next week or he is going to see us next week. Thank you, everybody. So, okay, let me sign off for right now. And let me say um, to newcomers, thank you so much for your contributions and your ideas. And to, um, I, I want to call you old comers, to the people that have been in my class for many times, thank you for returning. And I invite everyone to um, uh, do their homeworks of watching the recorded lessons and to prepare for next week. And I'll send out the um, concept of the Merkaba. And for anyone who's catching this, who is not a formally enrolled student, I invite you and encourage you to access this information. I want people to know about it. And if you feel called, please enroll so that you can, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I have much, much more in-depth presentations in the recorded class, and we will at a certain point get even more fun and interesting homeworks. So please enroll formally in order to participate and learn everything. Thank you so much.